Hello! I am Bruce Rain from Brankus Creations and welcome to my live stream. Please let me know if there are any problems with audio or uh, video or anything like that. As far as I can see everything is working but you know with uh, with live streaming and OBS you never know. Um, so uh, welcome to everyone. If this is the first time you've been on one of my live streams please jump on and say hello and if it's one you've, if you've been on it before please jump on and say hello as well. Um, today I am going to be recapping a Quadra 660 AV, which just happens to be one of my favourite Macs, and that has a lot to do with the fact that I used to use one of these professionally, and, um, and I just have a lot of, um, you know, nostalgic value associated with it, um, so, uh, I do, uh, I do really like this particular Mac. Uh, for those who don't know much about the uh, 660 AV. It uh, was released in 19, uh, 1993. Uh, it has a 68040 CPU, which is running at 25 megahertz. It was the little brother to the uh, eight, uh, so the 840 AV, uh, which came out at the same time in a sort of uh, mini tower type case. Audio firing through a pair of Apple designed speakers because the mood. I can't do much about that um i can uh, i can do something about this part i can say hello so how does that sound through the audio design speakers um so um <clears throat> um hello dan hello dana thank you for joining in on the stream and uh and so so yeah so the uh, 660 av um 68040 um 25 megahertz and and uh, the other really important thing about this, the same with the 840AV, was the fact that it had a DSP, or Digital Signal Processor, which I'm going to point to when I can find it. Here it is. It's there on the board, just there. It's got an AT&T logo on it. It'll be out of focus, probably. And it has DSP written on it, Digital Signal Processor. So, one of the things... Hello, Aaron. Uh, I am well, thank you. I hope you are the same. Um, video has a little half second jitter every 30 seconds so that's not usually there not sure if it's you or me well if anyone else can uh you know corroborate let me know if there is a jitter not that i can do much about it to be honest the uh at this stage everything appears to be streaming well um so i it all it does look like it's okay i'm just gonna go through the uh the cameras here and we'll just do a quick little test of all the cameras there's me there's the microscope which is out of focus, let's focus that, there's the microscope, and there's the side angle, there's a, hey, hey, look at that side angle there, hey, hey, look at my board here, um, okay, video is good for me, hello Trina, welcome to the stream, um, I thought I would just write on Steve's coattails, those of you who uh, don't know uh, Steve or Mac84 on YouTube, uh, he ran a stream earlier today. He was, he was playing around with a Macintosh 128K and a Macintosh SE. It got me in the streaming mood. So, um, so here I am. Um, now, um, yeah. So, I'm getting messages. Okay, someone's uh, yeah, someone's sending me messages as they tend to do. Okay, so 660AV digital signal processor. The one great thing about this is the fact that it has video and audio in and out. So you could actually capture video onto this and, uh, and then you could actually output the screen to a television. Um, and, um, and so, yeah, it's, it's just a really, really good one. And of course, I came from, you know, using Mac since the old 68000 days. Probably, you know, Mac Plus would have been probably, I don't think I ever used a 128K or 512K professionally, but I did use a Mac Plus. Um, and, uh, and of course, every time Apple would bring out a new computer, it was like, you know, wowzers. And I remember when the 6804 came out and we got a 660 AV and we got an 840 AV, the 840 AV was obviously the most powerful. That thing really cranked. I think it was a 40 megahertz, uh, 68040. So that was a really, really good, uh, fast computer at the time that just blew us away. When we opened up Photoshop and did an unsharp mask, it was just wild. It's just... That was amazing to watch. But what I really loved about the 660 AV was the fact that it was in the pizza box case. And during the weekends, I used to, with the permission of my employer, 
take the 660 AV home at times. I would actually grab that great big pizza box and I would, uh, you know, sort of go home and I would fire it up and use it over the weekend and play games that I couldn't play because at the, at the time I had a Mac 2 um, at home and uh, it was a little on the slow side. And so, uh, yeah, using this at home was just awesome fun. So that's the nostalgia associated with this board for me. Uh, with this computer, but there is something really special about this 660 AV, and the special thing is, it's mine! Um, normally when I, um, I am uh, doing these recapping videos, they're usually other people's boards, but this one is actually mine. Um, so I'm going to be recapping this one today. Um, it's going to be very similar to my other recapping videos. Um, it will involve me recapping. Um, so just, uh, again, for anyone who's not really familiar with the recapping process and just based on everyone I see here in the, uh, in the chat, I'm sure all of you are, but I will still go through it for the purpose of anyone that might watch this at a later date. Um, this, uh, has a whole series of these surface mount electrolytic capacitors, these little aluminium little things poking up here, little cans, little poking up on the board there and surface mount electrolytic capacitors don't last, uh, very long. Uh, these ones here, these uh, yellowy ones, are tantalum capacitors, and they do have a much longer lifespan. And even though this computer, this one still works, uh, I'm going to replace the caps as uh, part of preventative maintenance. Uh, we'll probably find there will be leakage under them. We'll smell it. We'll be able to see it when it, to the electrolyte burns. Basically, these are going to be replaced with tantalum capacitors uh, and uh, as part of uh, sort of kind of future-proofing this board, I guess you would say. So, um, so I'm going to be uh, taking off all these capacitors. There are, I think from memory, 11 47 microfarad 16 volt capacitors and two 10 microfarad 16 volt capacitors. The, the 10 microfarad ones are these little guys up here. There's two little ones and all the rest of the bigger ones. Now, if you are planning to do this yourself or playing along at home, I do have a cheat sheet for a completely different computer. I do have a cheat sheet for the 660 AV which you will find on my website recapamac.com.au um, if you actually just do a google search for recap a Mac my website should come up fairly high on the search results so in there on the in the resources menu you will find uh, the 660 AV listed under 1993 I have recently uh, altered that uh, resources menu of the recap a Mac website so that it has uh, it has all of the different computers grouped into the year they were released. So this you'll find under 1993. And this basically goes in and shows you the whole board and then shows you all of the um, the capacitor uh, uh, ratings there, the uh, capacitance rating and the voltage rating, and then uh, showing you the orientation, which one is plus and which is minus. So is the CPU a full 040 or an LC 040? I am very happy to say it's a full -un. It's a big one. Uh, the um, the LC ones were, you know, sort of largely reserved for sort of the 040 uh, LCs at the time. The 660 AV was still considered, even though it was the lower end version in terms of the uh, the 840 AV was the big one and then 660 was the next one down. These will, still were considered up at the higher end of the, uh, of the, the Mac models at the time. So they did put a full 040 chip on there. So that's uh, good to know. Um, so, uh, and you can also see here on the board that we have some onboard RAM there. And I'm pretty sure this is onboard video RAM is here as well here. And g given the fact that this doesn't actually have a, um, uh, you know, a slot for a VRAM SIM, it's a good thing that it has uh, onboard VRAM because otherwise we would have none. Uh, I believe this can output up to 1152 by, what is it, 870, I think is the resolution. I think that's the maximum resolution this can do. Um, this has built-in Ethernet. There, we've got the AUI uh, plug on there, so you can attach one of those dongles on there to uh, to get Ethernet. It has a geo port on this. It's also got um, uh, serial ports. There's the video out, and we've got uh, uh, the ADB port there as well. So... Uh, and I think one of these might be an S video input as well, which looks exactly the same as an ADB port. So you just got to make sure you don't get those mixed up. I won't try and plug it in at the moment, seeing as I don't have the uh, the case uh, here to show which one is which. Um, 
but uh, but yeah, so there's one of those is a GA port, one of them is a serial port, one of them is a uh, S video in, and then the uh, the in and out of the video, the composite video, they go in. There's little leads that come out of these little white plugs here. Yeah, wrong end. I do this all the time. There and there, little white things there. Okay, so. Uh, I think that's enough of my blathering, so I think it's probably time to recap. Um, so I am going to, the first thing I'm going to do is remove these capacitors. And uh, as is uh, um, as is my normal procedure, I remove them with hot air station. Uh, and I use hot air because of the, um, I, I just find that that does less damage when I'm removing them. If I try and remove them just with a soldering iron, or you know, using the. I actually, I, sh I really should mention that the the um, uh, people still are talking about the idea of removing electrolytic capacitors by twisting them and pulling them off, or just yanking them off. I just need to show quickly. Not this one. This is a color classic board. I just recapped the other day, and this was one where the the owner uh, actually had a go at removing the capacitors using the twist and pull method um, and uh, he managed to remove completely remove two pads in the process and uh, I think you know kind of lifted but not lifted off about another four or so so just in case anyone is sort of still thinking you know what just grab a pair of tweezers and grab the top of the the capacitor and twist and pull it off I really don't recommend it I've been able to repair it and that's great but, um, and it works. Uh, so, you know, all's well that ends well, but just keeping in mind that just don't, um, you, I just would never ever recommend yanking the, the capacitors off. Just not a good idea. Um, so uh, you can remove them with just a soldering iron. I have demonstrated that in one of my videos before. I will demonstrate, again, demonstrate it again if people would like me to. Um, it's a bit fiddly and it's still, it's a bit risky at times but uh, it can be done. But I think, um, you know, sort of on the whole, um, uh, you know, sort of using the hot air is best. Now there is one exception to that, to that here, and I'm just gonna jump across on the microscope. Actually, I'll, I'll jump across to this little side view first, because this probably gives you a better idea. Uh, just here, uh, we have, uh, it's up here. Uh, we've got a little capacitor sitting in there and he's living next to this is next to the CPU, which has the plastic socket there. This we've got the plastic, uh, you know, sort of card slot here. I've got the plastic battery holder there. So we've got a little capacitor there, just living in a, a land of plastic. So uh, uh, hello, Retro Redrum. Thanks for joining. Hello, MacMan142. Um, and I am now going to probably start pulling this apart. So let's just go here to the microscope. And we'll have a look at that. Now, you know, as I said, this one still works, but we can clearly see here that we've got uh, leakage. And it's it's evident there in that yellowing around here. I'm just going to point to that. See, there's this kind of yellowing on the uh, on the pad there. And that is a clear indication that we've got some a little bit of leakage going on there. But, hey, you know, it's we've caught it with plenty of time. This one should be absolutely fine, no problem at all. So... What to do about this one? This one's a little bit difficult because uh, it's surrounded by plastic and it's hard to get a soldering iron in there as well. So this one's going to really suck. So I'm going to be using my little heat shields, which are my little blades, the little blades like like these blades that you get out of a um, you know a, uh, a box cutter type knife thingy, and you can snap them to different lengths. So I've got my different lengths here, uh, and I've got my little springs that I flick over the top of them uh, I'll put over the top like this so that I can then rest them on the board and have them uh, standing up so that's that's my contribution to society uh, these little uh, heat shields here um, so there you go um, right now I do have more of these heat shields though but for some reason heat shields go missing and I've talked about this before I've, I've definitely got there's a little fairy that steals capacitors, and I'm thinking that that fairy is now stealing heat shields as well. Um, so here's one here. So uh, let's put that there. I need another spring. Uh, 
the theory steals the springs as well. Yes, well. Right. Okie dokie. Um, right, so anyone who happens to just be joining for the first time, I am recapping a Quadra 660 AV, and as I mentioned before, the thing I love about this 660 AV more than any other 660 AV is this one is mine. Which means that I get to play with it afterwards. So, uh, I'm going to apply some hot air here. I'm hoping that I've got these shields offering enough protection for all the plastic. I mean, if I do melt some plastic on this, it's not the end of the world because it is mine. But I would rather not melt it. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, Dana, welcome to uh, welcome to the stream. Welcome to the chat. Um, we've just been killing time until you got here. Um, so, uh, bum, 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 bum. sorry, I'm looking for a smaller. No, I'm gonna have to snap this. I'm just gonna snap. Actually, I'll grab this longer one and I'll snap a bit off the end of that. Snap. I'll do that without, hopefully, without injuring myself. There we go. I've got just a little, a little one now. Uh, the uh, that other one was a little bit too big and was hanging off the board, so I'm going to just grab this little one, and I'm hoping that that means I can get this to stay more securely in position. Yeah, that looks better. That does look better. You can't really see it there. I'm afraid one of the big problems with the microscope is that when I um, uh, I I when I look through here, I see a great big circle. But of course, what gets shown in the live stream is a rectangle taken out of the middle of that circle. So I can see way, way, way more than is uh, shown. Okay, so after taking that off, um, I can sh I'll just remove my heat shields here so I can pay a little bit more attention here. Um, uh, yeah, g'day, how you going? G'day, how you going? You got well, actually, the... The, the, the proper way to do it from an Australian perspective is, how's it going all right? So you basically provide the answer for the person in the question. So how's it going? And then full stop, all right, question mark. So how's it going all right? G'day, how's it going all right? Yeah, good thanks. Good thanks. Yourself? There you go. There's a, a nice little bit of uh, Aussie greeting for you. All right, so this here is, uh, these little red dots, they are uh, component uh, surface mount component adhesive and so basically what happens is a machine comes along and it spits out these little bits of adhesive and then a big robot comes and grabs components and sticks them on the adhesive they bake it so that the components are stuck to the board and then they run this through a solder wash and uh, the solder then sticks to all of the uh, uh, all of the pads and stuff like that and so uh, the component adhesive holds the component in place until they get soldered so uh, um, <clears throat> so anyhow that's um, that's a bit of a pain uh, only because when when they've got the uh, component adhesive on them the capacitors come up they're a lot harder to remove but you don't want to apply too much pressure because you're always worried about tearing a pad so you know it's just uh, an added complication but you know it's just how it is with these I do actually have some of this component adhesive here which as you can see is this lovely red color isn't it beautiful it's one of the many collections of goop that I keep here I have all sorts of goop uh, I've got adhesive goop and I've got threadlock goop and I've got um, liquid electrical tape goop and conformal coating goop and um, UV solder mask goop, uh, flux goop, um, uh, what do you call this stuff? This is the um, uh, solder, I don't know what's this stuff called? Solder paste goop. So lots of different types of goop with this. And of course, they're all poisonous. They're all terrible. Oh, thermal paste goop. They're all, um, uh, you know, bad for you and you don't want to breathe them in and all that sort of stuff. So anyhow, uh, moving along. Um, right, so this one here, again, we've got to actually, no, we've got no plastic here. Look at that, DSP. It's our lovely digital signal processor. Point of difference, look at this little guy. A little dead spider. Hello? Hello? Or is it just a shell? It might have shed its skin when it got bigger. <clears throat> All right, so, um, 
I hit reload on the stream and the jitter stopped, by the way, in case anyone else gets that one too. So, yes, I'm just letting everyone know Dana was having a jitter before on the stream. Um, and which, you know, I am glad that that has been resolved. And yes, it's the old uh, IT thing, you know, switch it off and on again. So, you know, restart and see how you go. All right. So, um, what am I going to protect? I might protect the DSP. Uh, with my heat shield here, so I've got my digital signal processor and then I've got a heat shield there So I'll just come into my side angle here again so that we can I can demonstrate this. This is only a 720p camera That's why it looks a little bit blurry. I have tried a higher resolution camera But unfortunately when I do that when I have the high-res camera here and the high-res camera there I can not I can only seem to get one of them to work. and I'm not sure why um, You know, I, I might try and fix it one day, but anyhow in the meantime, 720 it is. <clears throat> okay, so a couple of heat shields here. Um, I'm going to spin this around. And I'm going to hit it with some hot air and knock him off. Um, for anyone sort of playing along at home, I am using a quick 861DW hot air station. I have it currently set to 400 degrees Celsius. And I have the air blowing at the maximum power that it runs at. Um, so it's cranked right up. Now, that's fine for doing this, but you do have to be careful when you are around, uh, you know, sort of components that might get blown off with that uh, high power air. Um, and in which case, you know, I suggest then uh, reducing the air output. But for what I'm doing here, I'm quite happy to have this blowing full crank. I'm just going to remove some of this adhesive. This adhesive gets all gooey when uh, it's been heated. It makes it easy, a little bit easier to get off. Um, I uh, didn't change over to the microscope view, did I? No. Nope. Sorry about that. Um, okay, so I'm just going to remove some of this adhesive so as I was removing that adhesive before and describing the way it was happening and everything you weren't seeing it all sorry about that um, okay so uh, with the hot air if I'm working around um, if I'm working around components like I don't know let, I'm just going to move the mic the microscope here like these diodes here actually look here's here's a classic one so this guy here that's a diode and that's like a little cylinder that's soldered on there. Now, these are notorious for rolling off because, well, look at them. They're bloody round. They're like a little little tube on there. And so if I hit that with a bit of hot air, let's just say I was trying to remove this chip here and I'd be hitting this with hot air, this thing would get hot and then that would just come rolling off with the extra hot air. So obviously I would want to try and protect that with a heat shield or something. But when I'm working with those components that are more likely to roll off, I might drop the, temp the, uh, the air output down a little bit and maybe crank the temperature up a little bit. So it's a little bit hotter, but it's not blowing as hard. So, I, you know, I'll generally do that when I'm, if I'm in a, in a dangerous area, like where there's big clusters of components like this that might just, you know, capacitor like this might just come flying off. So, um, okay, so <clears throat> a Mac of his own this time. Yes, thank you, Mac man. Um, yes, yeah, so I don't, um, I, you know, I mean, I, obviously I do sort of work on some of my own computers, but a lot of what I've been doing lately has been recapping other people's computers. And uh, I've had this one sitting around for ages because I'm sort of like, oh, you know, I should probably turn this into a stream or a video of recapping it and everything. And then I just, the other day I was looking out and I thought, I really want to play with this thing. So I want to recap it. Uh, so there we go. So. Uh, right. Now. A, a smart man might put another heat shield there so that it's protecting our uh, digital signal processor. So we'll put that there. I just realized something. My camera is completely crooked. So I'm just going to try and uncrook it. No wonder I was having so much trouble. So here's something that is might be of interest to anyone out there that might be perhaps thinking of buying one of these microscopes in the future. Um, this uh, microscope has, it's, it's um, uh, what they call trinocular. So obviously binocular is two eyes, trinocular is three. So this is the third one and this basically is where the camera goes in. 
Now, I could theoretically stick another eyepiece there, but I don't have three eyes, so there'd be no point. So, um, so I'm looking through these two eyepieces, and then this camera is looking is actually sharing the same view as the left eye via a little sort of um, prism inside there. Now, um, this camera uh, sits inside this, and it's got like a little uh, what would you call it, kind of rubber O-ring in there, which is designed to make it slot in and slot in kind of stiff. And it is just totally ineffective. It, when I put it in there, it just wobble, wobbles around. I mean, if I didn't have all of the cables coming out the top, it may not be a problem. But, you know, it's just, it's really annoying. You sort of spend all this money on these things, and you sort of think, couldn't you guys have made it so that the camera doesn't wobble? Anyhow. Just having a whinge. Don't mind me. All right, another cap to come off. I'll try and speed this up, otherwise this will take forever. I mean, the problem is that these caps are just scattered all over the board. It's not like I have a little cluster where I can just sort of knock four off at one go. I have to keep moving the uh, uh, the the uh, little uh, shields, the little heat shields. I haven't got very good access to this one, so this might pop because I'm applying rather a lot of heat to it. Come on now. I just can't get the heat to the other side, um, which is why I'm having so much trouble getting it off. There we go. <sighs> that was a fun one. Yes, this, this is very true. The component density is pretty full on. Um, incidentally, we can see around here and around here albeit it might be a little bit out of focus. We can see this blackening stuff here. That is uh, leaked electrolyte that is burning with the uh, hot air station. So these capacitors are leaking, even though they don't look too bad. I'm just going to apply some heat here to get these off. There we go. Whoopsie. I might uh, try and choose something plastic here. Get a smudger. Try and get these off. Because I am, I just, uh, as I was, oh look, it's a melting. Um, as I was uh, removing um, that little bit of adhesive, you'll see that I actually nicked a um, uh, a trace. And I don't want to do that. I don't want to nick traces. So. Stupid adhesive. I don't like it. I don't like it. Funny how plastic melts, isn't it? Um, okay, so there's that one. It's not one of my finest removals, but you know, I'll probably hit that with a, that little exposed bit there. I'll probably hit that with a bit of uh, UV solder mask just to protect it before I put another component on there. Here's another one. God, they just the capacity. There's a little group of four over here, but other than that, all the rest of them are just scattered everywhere. This one here, which is living amongst RAM uh, chips. I can't remember how much RAM this has on board. Um, if someone else has got the uh, tools to Googleize that and tell me how many it is, it's probably it's probably four. Uh, it, it might be eight. I can't remember. Um, but yeah, it has some RAM on board and it has two RAM SIMs to allow me to put some more on there. And I I can't remember what the maximum RAM is for this either. So isn't this terrible? I'm I'm not providing all this useful information about this computer. Um, I'm pretty sure I have a couple of 32 uh, meg sims, so I will be able to take this one up to 64 with the sims and then uh, whatever I then add on, uh, you know, whatever is on the board. Um, okay, lifting that off. Once again, we still see, we do see leakage here. There's That's leak, definitely leakage residue there, so that cap is definitely, definitely leaking. Um, now we've got some, I'm going to go up to these ones here, up around the, uh, up around the ports. There's modem, video, oh look, this, this, it was all written on the board for me. So here we go, we've got, the first one is an ADB, the second one is camera, 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 okay, monitor, that's fine, I understand monitor, camera, is that the geo port? Maybe. 
I don't know. Um, video out modem. So that's the one that looks like an ADB is actually an S video out. Then we've got modem. So that's your RS RS232 printer, RS232, and SCSI and Ethernet. So there we go. Um, S video input. Yep, that's this one here. No, video out. Oh, S video input. Is that an S video input? Huh. Huh. Okay. Welcome, Steve, to the stream. I mean, what time do you call this, eh? Huh? Boy, boy. I'm just joking, of course. I know you've been sitting there playing with your compact Max. And I don't blame you. They, uh, rather envious of those, particularly that 128K with the upgrade. Wowzers. For those who might want to jump on and have a, if you haven't seen it, have a look at Steve's stream from earlier. Uh, where he uh, got hold of a Macintosh 128K with a uh, with an upgrade um, with, uh, that upgraded it to allow four megabytes of RAM. And if you've got an, you, it even had an, a couple of extra slots that allowed you to put in two megabytes of RAM as a RAM disk. And um, and it gave allowed you know sort of brought SCSI to the 128K. Um, and of course, it was also upgraded ROMs that allowed it to read 800K. Uh, we use an 800K floppy drive, so that was quite a find, I can tell you. Um, now I've got these resistors just down here, which I'm going to have to keep an eye on because I don't want to accidentally remove them. I'm having real trouble getting a heat shield here in a useful spot, uh, but I've got this nice big piece of plastic here. You know what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna mix it up. I'm gonna mix it up. I'm gonna take this one off with a soldering iron. How do you like that? All right, so there's some goop. There's my flux, Amtech flux. Links down in the description. Pretty much everything that I use here, there are links down in the description. So if you are thinking, hmm, soldering iron. What sort of soldering iron is that? Oh, soldering iron tip. What's that? Uh, it's all there, um, and uh, I've I've even got a few low cost alternatives to some of the stuff I use because, at the end of the day, you um, you know I mean a lot of this gear ends up costing a lot of money, and if you're planning to just do it yourself and not do it for other people, you might be looking for some low cost alternatives, and so I have provided some of those. So first thing I'm going to do with this in removing this capacitor is I'm going to add some new solder to the old. So uh, this is part of making it easier to remove so just going to try and get some this one's not being very helpful unfortunately but it, it's getting there you can see the the new solder on the pad there so i'm just gonna keep working away at this all right and then i'm going to do the same on the other side without hopefully without melting that bit of plastic how close is that plastic How close is it? Okay. Come on. Having trouble getting this solder in here because I'm a bit cramped. Come on. Now, you can see that I'm moving the capacitor. It's wobbling like that, which is great. What's not moving is the plastic bit at the bottom, and that's because it's stuck on with adhesive. So, I've added some new solder. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take away the new and the old solder with a bit of solder wick. Once again, links in the description if you want to buy some. Very important stuff. It allows you to suck solder up. It is braided copper that has been uh, sort of saturated with flux. And you can see that when I apply it here, the uh, solder wants to naturally uh, make its way onto this braided copper. Now, this is where it gets tricky because in order to remove this, I have to kind of lift it up at one side, then go, turn to the other side and lift it from the other side. Excuse me. Um, and I'm going to try and lift this now and just see what happens. So I'm applying some heat and I'm lifting and I'm just getting a little bit of space. You can't really see it. It's hard to tell 
I can see because, as I mentioned before, I have a binocular view here, which means I do have some depth perception with uh, looking through this microscope, whereas you're, of course, only looking through um, with, you know, one eye sort of thing. You're looking through the left eye here. Um, but I could actually see that as I was lifting that up, I was getting a little bit of space underneath the uh, the uh, pin of the uh, of the capacitor. So you can see all that solder sucking up. You can see the... Uh, the uh, wick changing colour from copper to sort of going silver. All right, so let's apply some heat here and let's lift. Oh, look at that. Off she comes. That last bit was just the, the moment where the, um, the adhesive gave way. There's my adhesive. I really, really don't like adhesive on these things. It, it annoys me no end. And, of course, part of that is because... I wonder if I've got a low temperature setting here. I can use this really quickly. Yeah, I have. I've got one. Oh, no, I don't. Just where I can just sort of melt this slightly without melting everything else. Melt. Melt. It's working. Melt. Yeah, I just, I mean, I, it, it, part, it, this is mainly just because of my... Um, wanting things to look really neat and tidy i uh, i just don't like those little bits of adhesive there oh hello jay welcome to the stream uh what time is it over there what is it 9 9 30 p.m over there so are we uh before or after dinner sorry i'm just turning on my uh, turning on my um uh ultrasonic cleaner because i just realized it wasn't on and of course i'm going to want to clean this afterwards and I like the ultrasonic cleaner to be nice and warm. And to be honest, the heaters in those things are useless and they take absolutely forever to heat up. Apparently what you can do is uh, get like a uh, like a fish tank heater, which is like a, you know, sort of, or, or even like a, you know, sort of a, a heater that you would put into, uh, uh, you know, you can get external heaters that you drop into the into the uh, liquid and you can you can put that and that'll heat them up a lot quicker. So anyway, after dinner, we're on the couch watching you on the big screen. Oh, wow. Hang on. Yeah. Hello on the big screen. Okay. There we go. Microscope big. Back to there. Um, 9.30 p.m. in Canada, Toronto time. Excellent. So that's... Well, that's the same as uh, Eastern Standard Time, I think, is it not? I, I, I don't know. It's I can tell you what it is here. It's one thirty p.m. on Saturday, so I'm in the future, and uh, over here we have flying cars in the future. Um, okay, so that's that capacitor removed. Um, we don't really have flying cars. Sorry. Um, Right, so another capacitor to remove here. Um, I'm, I'm sure we're all starting to uh, get familiar with the process here. Heat shields on. And then, whoop, off this capacitor comes. So, <clears throat> right. Oh, I've got this down on the low setting. So, cranking the heat up again. Let's get rid of this one here. Try not to lift anything else off the board. I've got one side. Is it? Is she about to blow? Look out! She's about to blow. Come on! There we go. Oh, look! I lifted a pad. Shame on me. Well, on the bright side, it's not torn and it will be able to be fixed. Let's get all this adhesive off while it's still hot. Stupid adhesive. There we go. Let me just check up on the chat. Uh, east, yes, East Coast time. Yes, okay. So, um, pad on the left looks suspect. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's, it's grubby. I, that's going to come up all right. But yeah, this one here, I did lift it. But I mean, once I get the new cap on there, that'll hold it down. It'll be okay. I've just got to make sure I don't destroy it while cleaning it. Um, but I have been in this situation before. And I am hopeful that uh, 
I will be able to get myself out of this pickle without doing any further damage to the computer. Or more importantly, without anyone ever knowing there was any damage. Okay. Whoopsie. Okay, so applying a little bit more heat here. I better put another heat shield in here. I just realized I'm right next to the SCSI port. Right. I've got two in a row here, so I'm hoping to be able to remove these at the same time. Um, there's one. And two. They come off nice and easy because they're smaller. And so that's great. And then let's see if we can get this adhesive off while they're still warm. Once again, look at all that leakage there. Definitely leakage. Uh, starting to dry, starting to get hot. I mean, get cool. Harder to remove. Once I start cleaning this, I'll be doing it with, um, you know, soldering iron with a bit of heat and, you know, and the wick and everything. That'll probably help most of it come off. Um, okay, so that's two. The two little ones have come off. And then I just feel like I've been removing caps from this thing forever. Uh, we are down to the last five. Uh, thankfully, three of those are right next to each other, so they'll come off nice and easily. Look at this serial number sticker. Can you see it? I was probably out of focus, but see how crooked it is? What did the work experience kid put that on? Jeez. I'm going to end up melting that, trying to, you know, sort of remove the caps near it. I'm very disappointed. Um, okay. Right. And I think my camera's crooked once again. Ah, stick it on. I need better tape there. I just did that in a hurry because I cleaned the microscope just recently. And uh, and when I put it back together again, I didn't use proper tape to hold the camera still. I've just got cap tan tape there, which isn't very bendy. Okay. Um... Take a photo of it before you melt it. Um, what was I melting? Oh, the serial number. Oh, yeah. Okay. I can do that. Um, camera. Trusty camera. Um, and I'm going to just move this to one side for a moment. There we go. Photo taken before I destroy it. Where does the assembled in-country sticker say it was made? Ah. Uh, okay, I know exactly where it was made. So throw forward some guesses. I'd be very interested to see what you guys uh, come up with for where it was assembled. So uh, let's see how... I'll just have a quick check here. 17 viewers. So... Let's see if we can see 17 guesses, or at least close to it. Someone, I mean, someone's probably watching it and falling asleep, so I won't necessarily get seven. So, uh, all right, let's let's uh, let's see where people think this might have been assembled. Now, uh, for those who may not have seen a recapping stream before, sometimes these capacitors pop. And when they do, I sometimes involuntarily make a little squealing noise. So just prepare everyone for that possibility that if one of these pops, I might squeal. So, um, Utopia Planet Planitia Shipyards? Uh, no, no. The Moon? No. Uh, Malaysia? I, okay, so let's go. Um, now... Interestingly enough, yes, okay, so uh, what we've got here is we've got Ireland, Singapore, Mexico, Malaysia, the Moon, Utopia, Planitia, uh, and Ireland again. Uh, so I can tell that you two of you, two of you are correct. This was indeed assembled in Ireland. So there you go. I, I could be wrong, and this I could be completely wrong about this, 
So um, forgive me if I am. But it was my understanding that at a particular point in history, there was some significant, I think, tax breaks or perks to doing this stuff in Ireland. I think Ireland were trying to get stuff happening there so that it would enable people to sort of set stuff up like and and uh, uh, and I think there might have been some tax breaks, and so that was one of the reasons why these things were being done in Ireland. But I could be completely wrong about that, so forgive me if I have just come up with nonsense. Uh, now let's see if I can remove this serial number sticker first, because to be honest, I want it to be on straight anyway. Um, I don't know if I can do it without wrecking it. So got a little bit of scalpel under there. Right now, I need my uh, special Revlon eyebrow tweezers, which are around here somewhere. Uh, they're really good for peeling stickers off uh, and keeping your eyebrows tidy. Uh, I have uh, ap apparently mis misplaced them again. Um, my, my workshop is just a, a horrible mess at the moment. Is my plan to clean it? later today but uh, I know that the later I leave these streams the less chance I am to get my because oh, right in front of me right in front of me uh, the less like I am to get my US viewers watching because it does get later and later at night and uh, when I reapply this sticker I will be able to put it on straight There we go. Sticker! Now, this is going to go over here in my little spot where I put things that I want to keep. Just there. Right. What's that? And why did I put it there? I know exactly what that is. And that is dead. So why would I put that in the key place? I can go in the bin. Uh, this, by the way, happens to be a uh, Mux chip. From a Macintosh SE30, one positioned at, I think it was UB8, if I remember rightly, which was, uh, if anyone who watched um, some of my streams, I did a, a Macintosh SE30 recapping, and when I finished recapping, I started it up, it bonged, it booted, everything was fine, except the graphics were all wonky, all these big blobs and stuff like that, and that happened to be a failed MUX chip, so I replaced the MUX chip, and that worked beautifully, so there we go. Um, oh, see, Dana was cheating. See, he knew it was Ireland because he's got one. That's all right. It's just knowledge, isn't it? Um, okay, uh, Nate, hello. Welcome to the stream. We are recapping a 660 AV here. I've just finished removing the serial number, uh, serial number sticker from the board so I can now apply hot air to it with impunity. I don't have to worry about melting the sticker because uh, these things are important to some people. Uh, right, okay, so here we go. These are the three caps in a row. Um, okay, looks like this logic board is covered in grease. So much leakage. Well, actually, that's a really interesting thing you say that, uh, that Dana, but was it was Dana that said it, wasn't it? Yes, it was one of the Danas here. Um, so we've got, we can clearly see this smeary stuff going on here. It's all glossy, and of course that's not surprising because this is where we actually have four capacitors all close together. So this is where I would expect to see most indication of there being leakage. And as you can see, this one is all smeary and leaky, and it is going to need to be cleaned afterwards. Uh, it's going to go into my uh, ultrasonic cleaner. Uh, you can, of course, clean these with a bit of isopropyl alcohol and a toothbrush, uh, or by washing them in some distilled water, some demineralized water. Um, but, um, you know, the, uh, the ultrasonic cleaner is really the best way to do it. Um, and it's very gentle uh, and it does get these things spotlessly clean. Um, and, and if you are going to do any sort of quantity of recapping, whether you'd be doing it for you, you'd be like Steve, Mac 84, who has 50 million computers in his basement. Um, and that where most of them need recapping, I think. Uh, if you're going to be in that situation, I would recommend having an ultrasonic cleaner or if you're planning to... Do a bit of recapping for someone else. Um, good to have a uh, an ultrasonic cleaner. There is really nothing as good as 
as getting the old uh, getting the old board out of the ultrasonic cleaner and having it look like brand new. It's fantastic. Yeah. There we go. Three of them out. Those were the ones right next to the RAM slot, so I'm very happy that they're gone. And then once again, we've got our little adhesive -y stuff. Which I'm going to try and get rid of. And uh, yeah, look at that one there. I mean, look at the leakage. Look at all the crust. That's thrown a mean crust there. Look at it. Um, yeah, 50 million and one. That's right. We picked up another couple today. Um... Movie time. We'll talk to you later. Okay, Jay, enjoy the movie. What movie? Um, and... Ow! I just burned myself on one of the old caps. Ouchies. See you later. It's been demoted to the bin. Um, right. Okay. Last capacitor. Then we can start getting to the interesting stuff and putting new ones on and cleaning pads and stuff. Is it really interesting? Probably not. Um... Okay, but it is, uh, it does always feel nice getting these old Macs working again. There's a great deal of joy in it, I think. Um, keeping them going, preserving a little bit of history. Uh, I and mean, as I said before, this 660AV was a computer that I used to use professionally, and it was one hell of a computer back in the day. It was really, you know, quite powerful, and it was small, and ow! Oh, that hot capacitor just landed right on my foot. Ouchie. All right. So, um, here we go. I have so many of these. I'm just going to go on to the side and look at them. Look at them. I mean, they're just everywhere. Just everywhere. Okay, um, right, so now it is time for us to clean these pads. We've got all of the uh, capacitors off, and as usual, I always go through and I uh, put on some uh, uh, some new solder um, and give it a little bit of rub around, and then I clean the old solder off, and then we're ready to put a new capacitor on. Um, anyone who might uh, be wondering why I wouldn't clean this board first, I've had quite a few people ask me that, you know, why wouldn't you clean the board first and then do this work to it? And the answer to that is that when I put the capacitors on, I do put flux on there. I put this goop. And even though it's a no clean flux, I don't like the look of it being stuck on there. So I always give it a clean afterwards. If the board is really, really ugly, I might clean it first. I actually had a, uh, a board here. This is a uh, 2VX, which I, um, I did a stream on a while ago. This one was covered in battery gunk. Now, this has been through the cleaner now. Um, actually, we, we put it through the cleaner during the stream. It's been through the cleaner, so there's uh, there's no more um, you know battery goo on it anymore. But it still doesn't work. Uh, what I found after cleaning this was that virtually every, well, well not every, but let's say 20, 30 percent of the components on this board had lost lots of their joints. Lots of the solder had corroded away. And then once I put it in the cleaner, the cleaner just removed the last little traces of corroded gunk. And then there were just a whole stack of these components that weren't actually attached to the board. I mean, they might have just been held on by one or two pads, but most of them were lifted off. So I have gone in and I have attempted to uh, um, reapply most of these components and add new solder and do all that sort of stuff to clean up the pads and all that. Still doesn't work, though I have to admit, by the time I got to about the... 20th component I was probably doing a bit of a half-assed job so I probably need to go back and do it with a little bit of renewed energy so this is basically a board where the customer sent this to me and said oh, do you think it can be fixed and my initial answer should have been no but I answered with maybe um, and I have spent so much time on this now even if I do get it working there is no way I will ever be able to charge enough for the time that I've spent on it. But that's just part of the fun. Right. That's that unpleasantness out of the way. Um, all right. So let's get into cleaning these. 
Uh, me big microscope. Microscope big, that's what we want. So, I'm going to start off with the one that I lifted the pad of earlier, which is somewhere here. Is it this one? Yes, it was this one. So, as you can see here, um, the... Um, this pad here is got a wobble and that's because I lifted it up a little bit from here as I was removing this I was lifting it with a uh, you know, at, a, at a bit of a weird angle and I was just pushing it a little bit too hard and so that's lifted off but that will be held on quite well once I um, once I put a, com a component on there and then I can always add a little bit of UV solder mask or even I can even put some more um, component adhesive on there but I really don't want to because I can't sit here and talk about how much I hate component adhesive and then go and put some on. So, right. Add some flux. Step number one. Step number two. Get my soldering iron. My Hacko FX951 soldering iron with a T12 tip. Um, T12. T12. T12BC2 tip, once again, links in the description. If you want to buy one of these, um, the links are in the description there. And I will get myself some solder. This is just my cheap solder. I've got expensive solder over here. Um, this is all leaded solder. This one is 60% uh, tin, 40% lead. My expensive stuff is 63% uh, tin, 37% lead. Um, and it's much finer as well, but this is my cheap stuff and I use my cheap stuff when I'm doing cleaning Because obviously from the cleaning perspective, I'm just going to be putting some soldering on solder on and then I'm just wicking it straight off again, so Right, let's get some solder on there being super gentle because this pad is already lifting off You can see I'm just gently rubbing in a circular motion here uh, making it so that the heat the flux uh, and the solder just push all of that grit out of the way and then we end up with a situation where solder is sticking to the whole pad rather than having that gunk on there really not enough flux here i'm going to add some more it's looking a little bit uh, smeary on the screen there i might need to clean it again let's get some more of that on there and then i use my solder wick which i'm running low on i better go out and buy some more today um, and I get the wick and I put it here and just remove the solder as well as gently rubbing. And what I'm doing is, and I do mean gently, I mean, let's face it, I've already got a pad here which is wanting to, to leave. And so I'm just gently, 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 gently. Right. So, am I... I'm just playing around. Yeah, see, it's sharper there. This is the this is an issue that we uh, uh, Jay uh, House of Moth and I discovered recently that when we're uh, uh, playing around with our cameras here, if they are slightly off alignment, they go a little bit cloudy. Okay, so I've got some isopropyl alcohol and a Q-tip here, uh, and I'm just going to gently rub this. And I think I could be wrong, but I think during the cleaning process, when I applied some heat to that pad. It melted the adhesive under it and has actually kind of stuck the, the pad back on the board. Um, yeah, it has. So that pad's actually stuck back on again because as I melted the uh, adhesive that was holding that pad on during the cleaning process, it, um, it stuck back down again. Now, it's still not perfect, so I'm going to be very gentle with it. But as you can see, it's all flary, I realise, but you can see here that these are now looking spotlessly clean. They are like new, sort of. So that one there is now ready for a new capacitor to go on. So, um, yes, it is. I mean, it is a very a satisfying thing to see the pad coming good. You know, I mean, I, 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 I've done a couple of um, kind of uh, just sort of soldering primer videos or well, I've done one and I talk about soldering quite a bit when I do these videos and one of the really really important things when you're getting soldered to adhere to something is making sure that both surfaces are clean 
you know, if you've got grit or dirt or black or whatever on there, don't expect the solder to stick to it. It needs clean metal to stick to. So unless your pads are nice and clean, you're not going to get a good solder joint. That's really, really important. Um, uh, I think my 660AB has an extra slot. Yours doesn't right next to C23 there. Let's have a look. Right next to C23. I'm looking for C23. I'm looking for C23. See, I've, I haven't got the microscope anymore. I'm using my, uh, my eyes with my glasses. And these aren't as good at seeing up close stuff. I used to be able to see up really close. But when I hit 40, my eyes broke. Right. Um, C, C, C23, you say. Okay. So you're talking about this slot right here right along there right here now i think i could be wrong let's have a look that's it a slot here you can see there's solder holes for it and there would have been a slot here now i could put forward two theories behind that and i don't know this because this is the only 660 a v board i have in front of me but i can put through two theories with that theory number one would be that that would be for a vram sim so I don't know that. I mean, this is the VRAM here. So it is possible that that is related to VRAM. You may have been able to, some of them may have had a VRAM expandability. The other option, which I think is more likely, is that that was a ROM SIM slot. And the uh, that they would have brought out a version that allowed you to put in a ROM SIM rather than having the ROM soldered on there. I suspect that's the ROM there. I think that is probably the ROM there. But um, so yeah, that uh, I think the most likely possibility is that is a ROM SIM slot there. So anyhow, uh, oh, there you go, Dale Cooper ROM slot. There you go. Um, so um, yep. All right. So I am going to now continue with my cleaning, and so I'm going to jump across here to the microscope. And oopsie, what have I done? I just clicked. I hate clicking just sort of by accident. You just never know what you're pointing at. I could have just accidentally clicked the stop streaming button, but I don't think I did. I think it's still going. What would make sense is 660AV, which from memory were the earlier versions. Yep, yep. As I say, that, is, that would be my most likely guess at being wrong. I have a few computers like that. For instance, um, 2SI. 2SI has a ROM slot, um, uh, and there are two versions of that that you can buy. The earlier, well, actually, I don't know whether they're earlier or later. I think the earlier ones used a ROM SIM, and the later ones had ROM soldered onto the board. I've probably even got an SI board floating around here somewhere, because I have an SI that got absolutely smashed by uh, something. So here is a 2SI, another one of my favourites. This one doesn't work, unfortunately. I do have a working one, but this is one of the ones that does not work. Uh, this one had some very bad leakage, and this had uh, a uh, some some sort of power supply issue, and it had suffered a terrible short somewhere, and the burn traces and all sorts of stuff. And I did get this working once, and then it stopped. And I haven't been able to find out why yet. Um, but what uh, what we have here, down here, there are two ROM chips right there. But what we also have here is a ROM slot there. Now, some versions of this had a ROM, ROM SIM and they just had blank spots on the board where there was no ROM on the board. But this is one of the ones that had the ROM on the board, so obviously this that SIM slot can be empty. And then, of course, with this 660 AV, they've taken that one further step and they've removed the um, ROM slot altogether and just left the space for it. So, there you go. Okay. Wow, this is slowing down. Sorry, I'm going to speed this up. Speed this up. Let's get some clean. Okay, let's get some clean pads here. <clears throat> Racing. Let's go. Right, these ones aren't as bad as the last ones I just looked at. You can see the solder virtually heading to the corners of the pads virtually straight away. Okay, and then we take it away. It always seems very counterintuitive to go in and say, hey, let's put some solder on just so that we can take it off again. Sort of seems counterintuitive and wasteful, but um, it is it is a good uh, it is a very good way of cleaning the pad. 
and so that's why I do it. Uh, the solar helps to clean it, and then we just take it off and leave it perfectly clean for when we put the new component on there. And that's uh, Master Gecko 4. That's Charlie, isn't it? I think. I think. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, if it is, hello, Charlie. If it's someone else, hello to the person whose name is associated with that name. I've forgotten. Um, all right. Let's get some cleaning going on here. I'm actually terrible with remembering names. I mean, like, really, really bad. And it's, uh, and it's not personal. Um, <clears throat> it doesn't mean, oh, you haven't left an impact on me. It just means I've forgotten your name. But I'm pretty sure that is. Yes, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I was right. It is Charlie. Hello, Charlie. Welcome to the stream. We are recapping a Quadra 660 AV which happens to be one of my favorite Macs because I used to work with one of these. So I have a little bit of a, you know, sort of uh, nostalgic personal association with it. And, uh, yeah, and I am actually uh, planning to do some future videos with this computer. Um, I'm planning to install system 7.5.5 on it. And, uh, have a bit of a play around with it. I'm actually planning to try and do some actual modern day work on it. We've been having all of these discussions lately about power PCs and whether you can still use them in this day and age. We've had some people say, no, you can't. And then we've had Grudy, uh, sort of uh, Greg Rutke from Rutke Mods, come back and say, yes, of course you can use it. It just depends on what you are doing with them. And that's very, very true. Uh, if you are someone who just wants to spend all your time on Facebook and Instagram and YouTube, then a power PC is not for you. But if you're someone who is doing, well, to be honest, quite a lot of things, power PC can still be very functional. And the same can be said about a computer like this. I know that sounds obscene, but uh, depending on what you're wanting to do, you still can do quite a lot on an old computer like this. Uh, if you're using sort of period correct software. So if you're using the software that this actually came out with at the time, let's say I was going to do some page layout. I could use, say, Quark Express on this quite happily. Uh, and you can do quite a lot with it. If I was wanting to write, you know, write some letters, I can use Microsoft Word on it. I can use, uh, I can use Excel. Um, I can use Photoshop. Um, I can, believe it or not, I can even do some 3D work on this. I can use Illustrator. Uh, what else have we got? I mean, there are lots and lots and lots of applications that were released at the time that, in my opinion, although they've got they've added a few bells and whistles for sure, uh, a lot of the core functionality is still there. Um, and you can do quite a lot with these computers as long as what you're wanting to do isn't browsing the web spending time on Facebook or, uh, or things like that. So, because no, these will not do that for you. Okay. Um, uh, you plan on joining the Mac Yak later? Voice chat on voice chat. Uh, not sure yet after this, I may have been. I was up super early today. Yes, uh, S Steve was up early today going out and getting himself some more computers because he doesn't have enough. Needs to have more. Bit like me like that <laughs> um, okay so people just discussing voice chat the voice chat we are discussing is the Mac yak voice chat on discord uh, if anyone there can be kind enough to share the link which I don't have anywhere on this stream for those who may or may not have heard of Mac yak that is a uh, YouTube channel um, where a group of guys, uh, I am one of those group, uh, of that group, and um, we get together on a weekly basis and we chat about Macs and Apple and whether it be technical discussion or political discussion or uh, silly discussion, and we just talk about Macs. And we do have a Discord uh, channel? Do we call it a channel? I'm not sure. I'm not sure of the correct terminology for Discord. And uh, 
So those who uh, might be fans of the Mac Yak uh, sort of show or team, they can sort of jump on and uh, have chats. And so, like for instance, uh, I think we popped on for a little while yesterday. Not for long though, because one of the big problems I have is that Mac Yak goes out at 8 p.m. Uh, U.S. East Coast time, and that is midday my time, which is right in midday on Friday, and it is my work day, and so I can't spend a whole lot of time afterwards because I have to get back and make money. Now, one thing that has just happened is one of my rolls of wick has just run out. Thankfully, I have a little bit left on this one, uh, but I am definitely going to have to go out and buy some today because I am dangerously low. This is crisis. I mean, I don't know if you've heard, but in this country, there's a bit of a toilet paper crisis going on at the moment, which there isn't really. It's just people are being silly. Um, you know, there's there's no shortage of toilet paper. People just, for some reason, seem to be buying it all. Um, but uh, it's nowhere near as bad as having a wick crisis. Can't have wick running out. Uh, thank you, Steve, for putting on the Discord um, uh, link. Uh, what have we got here? IRC works, yes, exactly. IRC works, yep, indeed. So, uh, just sort of anyone out there who is a System 7 fan, if you were looking to do email on a 68K Mac, you know, a 6804, maybe under System 7, System 7.5, are there any email clients that will allow you to connect to modern mail servers and actually, you know, get email? via, um, you know, sort of uh, from, from a modern mail server? Can someone tell me that? I mean, I know, obviously, in those in the olden days, you would use something like Eudora, excuse me, or Netscape Communicator. Um, but I'm just interested, will those old, will those old uh, programs still work? Uh, just see how I called it a program? Sounds the olden days. <laughs> uh, will they, will those old applications still work on... Um, on modern mail clients. I'm just curious as to whether they might have put in some sort of security measures that old mail clients won't won't use or something like that. So, um, what time is it here? It is currently two, about two, quarter past two on Saturday afternoon. Uh, I haven't tried in years, but Eudora used to work. Okay, well I'm, well, I'm going to be trying it soon. So, I want to see if I can get email on my... Uh, on my old 68040 Mac. Right, so there's another clean pad. Let's uh, move along to the next one. Cleaning is going a little bit faster than the removal, but only marginally. So we've got three in a row here. This should be a little bit easier to clean, so I'm just going to move along here. Yes, I am in the future. I'm in the fancy future here, um, hanging out with Marty McFly and Dr. Emmett Brown in the future, where we have... Uh, Flying cars and floating skateboards. Um, where are we? Looking for, yeah, yeah, there we go. Right, here we go. Marty. Okay. Still cleaning. Okay. Keep moving. Great Scott. I've just started watching Witcher. Is anyone out there else watching Witcher? And I finally watched uh, Justice League last night too. I'd never seen Justice League before. And yep, Henry Cavill's lip is just as bad as everyone said. Boy, oh boy. To be sitting there watching a movie where all you can think about is what Henry Cavill's lip looks like. Uh, hmm. This is my impression of uh, Geralt from, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, from The Witcher. Hmm. Hmm. That's kind of his dialogue, isn't it? Hmm. Do you have a bag of coin? Okay, cleaning off the pads. Those ones are nice and easy. Okay. 
AAV blog. Yep, he's a big Back to the Future fan. I mean, who wouldn't be? I mean, well, I mean, I'm sure lots of people are, but I think they those three are genuinely entertaining movies. They're the sort of movies that I can just watch. I can just decide to sit down and watch any time. I just find them really good quality entertainment. I do enjoy those movies very much. Um, so we've got the people here that watch EEV blog. So uh, I'll uh, this is my EEV, EEV blog uh, impression. Well, have a look here. Look at this. Look at this turnout. Oh, it's upside down. All the electrons are going to run out. So that's rude, isn't it? Isn't that terrible? Okay, I do love watching an EEV blog, I must say. That guy has got some knowledge. He is uh, my go-to if I'm ever trying to, you know, find out something to do with uh, electronics and stuff like that. He is one clever cookie. That's for sure. Oh, I've got my wrong flux here. This is my cheap flux. Well, it's not my cheap flux. This is... Uh, uh, a different type of flux that I got given um, to try out, and I don't like it. Um, I just don't think it works as well. It's one that was specifically designed to be used with either um, leaded or unleaded solder, whereas the other stuff I normally use is just for leaded solder. Uh, and But I just don't particularly like it very much. So... Um, Right, so, uh, uh, in like Flynn, yeah, yeah, I mean, sort of, one of the things that um, EEV blog, I can't remember his name, I, I, I know it, but I've forgotten it, as I said, I'm not very good with names, um, one of the things that he does love to do is he does love to be Australian on there, which I, I think is great, I mean, it's fun, you know, he's, he's sort of like really making sure that everyone knows all of the... Uh, Australian sayings and stuff like that, and, you know, and he calls he calls alligator clip, clips crop clips and stuff like that, which I, I love, you know, it's 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 good. Um, and his you know his channel, as I say, it is entertaining. You can learn a lot a lot from from the guy. Um, there is of course that that voice. Um, it's uh, uh, it's always there. Um, okay, here's my good one. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that too cloudy. That's right. So here's here's the flux that I buy, and here's the flux that I don't like. And as you can see, one of them I can This one on the right, I can see through. I can, you know, it's translucent. It's not transparent, but I can see the pad under it. Whereas this one here, I can't see anything. I, I don't even know where to start. And I just don't like that. Um, I much prefer the other one. Once again, links to the uh, Flux in uh, in the description. It's the Amtec NC599V2TF. The stuff is fantastic to use. So the, you know, when you're using a Flux, you want to make sure it is a no-clean Flux. The other thing is you want to make sure it's got a very high resistance to temperature because if, it's, if it burns away at low temperature... It just disappears before it has a chance to be effective. This one here, you, you see, does actually hang around when I apply heat to it. It's still here on the board. There's a bit of smoke, but you can see that there is still flux hanging around on the board. Um, so, I'm just getting rid of I've got a little. I'm, I'm probably putting a little bit too much solder on here at the moment, which is just a bit wasteful. Yes, yeah, a little bit. How's it going? Video I did about the massive IBM hard drive was interesting. I agree totally. I watched that one. Um, I did find that fascinating. Um, and he did one, I think, quite recently where he pulled apart a uh, the Huawei um, video encoder thingy. Uh, and I found that quite interesting as well. Now, one of the things that I'm going to do here when I've finished with this is I have scraped off a little bit of the UV, uh, sorry, a bit of the solder mask over these um, traces. And I, they're just too close to here for me to leave that way. I'm, I'm going to paint them over with a bit of UV solder mask. So, um, right, let's get that clean there. Right. 
Uh, oh, that guy. Yes, now he knows who E E V Blog is. Um, it's very hard to say quickly, isn't it? E E V Blog. Um, but he did um he did a, a video on uh, one that I really enjoyed. What was it? Someone in the chat might notice there was a um an IBM computer that came out. It was meant to be an entry level IBM computer. And it had these things that stacked onto the side of it. You could attach lots of them. So you would buy the base computer and then you would get these things that clipped onto the side to expand the computer. You could do a RAM expansion and stuff like that with these things that clipped on the side. It's quite a novel idea at the time. Uh, it was the Junior, something Junior. I can't I can't remember what it was. PC Junior, does that sound right? Um, and he did a video on one of those, pulled one apart and... Uh, and had a look at it. I found that really fascinating. I didn't know anything about the PC Junior, um, and I just thought that's a what a wonderful little computer. I mean, they were a, a, a sort of abysmal failure, but you, you know, you, you just they were um, what they intended for them and what they were were two different things, and they just didn't do well. Um, yeah, PC Junior, that's it, um, and. Um, yeah, but I thought it was a fascinating video as he had one because he had one and they, I can't remember what they called the things on the side. They were, uh, uh, the, he, someone else might remember that what those things were that they tacked onto the side. They did have a name for them. And I, he had a whole stack of them there. And I thought, oh, that's fantastic. And they even had a thing where you could add a power supply. So if you ended up with too many of them, the power supply in the computer wouldn't be able to pa uh, uh, you know, provide enough power for all of the little things stuck on the side so you could have one part long way along which is a power supply to add sidecar you could have a sidecar that was a power supply that added extra power for additional sidecars and i, I don't know i just I, I love it i mean it's it's the kind of it's the kind of stuff that i just think becomes really collectible because i mean here we are in a world where we've had personal computers now since the you know the, the late 70s i guess is when personal computers started getting into people's homes and stuff like that and, you know, during that time, no one really knew exactly how it was going to work out. I mean, indeed, some people even said at the time things like uh, there will never be a need for people to have a computer in their home. Um, and, uh, and of course, now we're in, a, you know, we're in this world where we've got sort of computers everywhere um, and uh, lots of computers in people's homes. And sort of back then, no one really knew exactly what was going to happen with personal computers. So when you come out with something like like a sidecar, you could look at that and think, oh, that's this is going to be the start of every computer from now on is going to start using sidecars. Or you can end up being the only computer that uses it, and that becomes collectible. You know, they're great. Um, okay, so now uh, where am I? I think I've cleaned them all. I'm just going to very quickly... Uh, Grab the board here and do a quick little cap count or a cleaning count. Oh, missed one. It's the first one. The very first one I removed is the one that I missed. But I'll check all the others while I'm at it. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. It's clean, isn't it? Yeah, thirteen. So there's a thirteen in total. So one more to do. And then we're done. I'm just going to have a quick look here and see how many viewers I've got here. Currently got 14 people watching. So thank you to those uh, 14 people that have been uh, sticking with the stream. Um, watching while I do this stuff, which could easily be uh, referred to as mind-numbingly boring. If you weren't someone interested in vintage computers and vintage computer restoration. But if you are interested, it might be, well, at least tolerable. Um, I do love, I, I, I have a, a real interest in the personal computer, um, uh, sort of, well, the birth of the personal computer, I suppose, and the, the industry and the growth of the industry and what it, you know, what it started off as and what it became. Um, for those who um, might be interested in learning about it, if you haven't, you know, if, if it's something that you might be interested in reading about, I can highly recommend uh, a book called, uh, what's it called? 
forgot the name of it. Uh, by um, uh, what was the name of the, the book? It was uh, it was by um, yeah, I'll, I'll clean this while I think. Um, it was by Robert Crindley, and it was uh, Robert X. Crindley, and it was not far in the valley. Uh, it was. Oh, look at this. this is my last bit of wick. Um, uh, now, there was a TV series spin-off of the book. The book's name will come to me. But the TV series spin-off of the book was uh, um, Triumph of the Nerds. It's a three-part, one-hour long. You will find it on YouTube if you hunt for it. Um, and it's an absolutely... Uh, fascinating um uh you know fascinating series and it's based on the book and the book is i think it's got got silicon valley in the name of it and it was uh well, someone just sent me an image and i'm just going to see if it is relevant to what i'm doing now or whether it's just like some sort of silly image that have been sent. ah this is the movie that jay is watching okay i didn't even know that movie had a sequel so there you go um <clears throat> Right, so I'm going to look up. I'm going to look up the name of the book right now, because it is well worth um, having a look at if you want to learn about the history of the personal computer industry. Uh, like, for instance, how Microsoft got its big start and nearly didn't. Uh, someone else could have kind of taken the spot. Um, so uh, we're looking at Robert Cringely. And I'm Googling it now. Robert Cringely book. I misspelled it. Accidental Empires. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Dale Cooper. You found it before I did. The old Accidental Empires. It is a really good book. It was written around about the mid-90s. So, of course, it's you know a long time ago. Computers have come a long way since then. But it is still a really, really good account of how they got to ultimately a hobbyist thing and became one of the biggest industries in the world. Um, so there we are, all clean, um, sort of uh, all clean pads, all ready for new uh, uh, capacitors to go on there. Here is my cheat sheet, so I know what goes where and what way around it goes. Um, I've, I've actually, I have to say, I've read a few um, sort of uh, books on personal computer industry i haven't read some of the ones that are there um but uh, uh yeah i you know i am always interested because as I, I just i just i i find the whole thing fascinating and even you know all of the different characters you know your your jobs wasniak gates paul allen um what's his name bomber developers 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 um Anyone who hasn't seen that video, jump onto YouTube and find it um, of uh, Steve Ballmer going uh, going nuts about uh, about uh, developers. Who said sit down? It is uh, funny and embarrassing. All right. Um, have you seen Halt and Catch Fire TV show? No, I have not. So I will be looking for that. Absolutely. Uh, not exactly history, of course, but interesting perspective on it. I did, um, what was that movie? There was a movie that was like a reenactment kind of thing of the Jobs uh, Wozniak thing um, with Noel Wiley as, um, as Steve Jobs and uh, uh, what's his name? Anthony Michael Hall as, um, uh, as Bill Gates. That was quite a good movie. Uh, I enjoyed that. Um, <laughs> Bomber is the Steve Irwin of developers. Yes, that's right. Um, he does get excited, doesn't he? Crikey! Um, all right, so let's. Um, I'm going to start when I'm doing these recapping ones. When we have more than one type of capacitor on there, in this one we have two types. We have 1147 microfarad 16, 210 microfarad 16. I generally put the ones, the fewer, on there first so I can get those out of the way, and then that way I don't need to be checking which one I'm putting on. It's just like all the rest are 47. So we'll start off with the little 10 microfarad 16. 
which I have here. Always keep good supplies of these. Uh, if you're wondering, if you're wanting to do this yourself and you're planning to buy the capacitors, if you go onto my Recapper Mac website and you go onto the recapping guide for the 660AV, you will find links. Uh, they point to mouse up, but to be honest, they are links to product codes. So they're actual manufacturer product codes. So if you want to buy them from somewhere else, you can just grab that manufacturer product code and search with whichever supplier you want, whether it be Mouser or DigiKey or RS Components or whoever. I do RS Components. Uh, Pirates of Silicon Valley, that is indeed the movie that I was referring to. And yes, it's it's I like it. I mean, you know, it's got a TV movie feel, but it's still a very, it's a very interesting story. At the end of the day, it's an interesting story. That's why it makes a good movie. Um, all right. So, uh, so yes, I, there are links to these, um, to the, the particular capacitors that I use uh, in this. Oh, I t I'll tell you what I will do before I do that. I mentioned before I had a couple of instances of... Um, what do you call those things? Um, traces that had got damaged during the removal. And I want to hit them with a little bit of UV solder mask. So they're good, good, good. All I'm looking for is ones where when I put the component on, the component might accidentally touch an exposed trace and create an accidental short circuit. Now you can see it's very small, but there is a little nick just there on that pad there. So... I'll probably hit that one with a little bit of uh, UV solder mask. I'm just going to clean it off first. Get as much as the goop off because I need this surface to be as clean as possible when I put the UV solder mask on there. There we go. It needs to not look like it has goop on it, basically. Okay. Now, what I use is... Uh, I don't have the solder mask tube here, but there are links to UV solder mask there. They're all pretty much the same. It is basically just a green stuff. It's this green stuff you see on here, really. It's just green stuff that you paint on and then you hit it with a little bit of um, UV light, which cures it. So I'm just going to plonk some on there. Boop. I'll just give it a little bit of... I, I've got something mixed in with it. I don't know what it is. I might just wipe that off and start again. Got something on the brush by the looks of it. Okay, let's try that again, shall we? I think it might be a bit of thermal compound. I think I had some floating around. There we go. There's a little bit of uh, UV solder mask just, just there. It's a little bit thick. I want to spread it around a little. There we go. Right. Okay, so how long does it take to UV cure? UV mask. And this is what I use to cure it. It is a globe with loads and loads of little UV uh, LEDs in it. When I switch it on, it'll go boo. You see it all blue there and fancy. Um, and then if I just put this here and let's see if I can work at the same time while that's UV curing. So let's find the other one that I was going to paint. Um, because I, eh, that's the other one. Look, I went straight to it. How good was that? Doesn't always work out that way, but I did this time. Um, okay, so, let's, can I do this? There we go. Now, the UV solder mask does actually cure quite quickly when you've got some very bright UV light. This one is not super bright. The best UV light, of course, is sun without clouds. But I don't have that today. It's actually quite cloudy here in Sydney. Um, today we've had some inclement weather, which is starting to improve, but it is still rather cloudy. A um, little bit more UV mask there. There we go. Whoopsie. Right. I realise this uh, this bit here where we're actually watching paint dry is, you know, it's like watching paint dry. Um, and I think there was one more. I'm just going to have a quick skim over the board, have a little look-see. Zoom out a little bit here because I'm a bit zoomed in. That's fine. Uh, I keep looking, looking, looking. That's that one. Ah, that's the other one. 
You see it there? You can see it. I can see it. Right. Hello, David. Welcome to the stream. Uh, quick little recap on what's going on here at the moment. A recap on the recap. I'm recapping a Macintosh Quadra 660 AV, which I was sort of mentioning before, is one of my favorite vintage Macs. And I have removed all the capacitors and I have cleaned all the pads. And what I'm doing now is I'm just applying a little bit of UV solder mask to the expo these traces here that I have accidentally exposed uh, while doing the cleaning process. And I'm just doing that because any of these exposed traces are in danger of either creating an accidental short if uh, part of the new component pin touches it. Um, or, of course, you know, oxidizing and getting all ugly afterwards. So, doing a little bit of cleaning up of my work there. And then I can start adding some new capacitors there. So, um, as I say, what we need to do now is we need to dry these. I'm using my UV light here, but um, I'm going to try and work while it's drying because I don't want to have to just sit here um, and... Uh, and wait for it to dry so let's uh, do some add some new capacitors here while we're waiting so we've got and these these are our little guys here the um, 10 microfarad 16 volt which I mentioned before which are going to go on first because there are only two of them and all the rest are 47 so I'm going to grab these the uh, situation with these as I have also mentioned before is that uh, what temp are you using on your solder iron for cleaning pads? Um, I use the same temp on my soldering iron for everything. I solder differently to other people. Um, I solder with my soldering iron pretty much on full crank all the time. 450 C, 450 degrees Celsius, which is very high. And a lot of people would say, too high, too high, no. Um, but I solder in a way where... I kind of regulate the temperature with the amount of time that I have the soldering iron on the stuff that I'm soldering. So I kind of move it quite quickly and I find I get, you know, nice results. I get nice, shiny, clean joins um, using that high temperature. Now, having said that, it isn't necessarily something I would recommend that other people do because it's kind of just kind of the way I've come to get used to soldering. And if your soldering iron is too hot, there is danger of doing damage and all that sort of stuff. So um, I guess, you know, what I would say is, you know, I am using 404, 450 degrees C, but that isn't necessarily going to be uh, the best for, for someone else. Um, but it is what I use. So that's, that is the answer to the question, a very, very long answer to that question. Um now, these capacitors that I'm putting on here, which are the 10 microfarad 16 volt, they are virtually the same size. Oh, look at that. What is this? This biscuity stuff going on here. It's a little bit of grubby stuff going to Just get rid of that. Um, basically, what happened is the um, little bit of flux hanging off the end of my uh, syringe here has picked up some grit from the table. So I've just degritted. So. Um, the capacitors that are going on here are virtually the same size as these pads. So they're a little bit tricky to put on because you really don't have much room on either side. Um, so um, in terms of the, uh, the uh, polarity of these, the way they go around, these are polarized capacitors, so they do need to go on the right way. Um, I need to put the positive, this is the stripe here, which indicates positive. So I need that to go to the plus sign. Now there is a plus sign just here, out of view, just here to indicate that that is the plus side. But another way you can tell is when in this, uh, excuse me, the silk screening that's going on here, uh, the silk screening shows where an electrolytic surface mount capacitor would go. And they basically have two sharp edges and then two beveled edges. And so the two beveled edges are always on the plus side. So let's plonk that down there. Plonk de plonk. Uh, and then I'm going to do the same with this one. I should actually mention, this is something I I didn't really say at any stage during this uh, stream. Now, these two look different. And that's basically just because one is 
AVX and one is Kemet. <coughs> both the same capacitor, both the same amount, no issue there at all. Um, and for the sake of it's my own one, I don't really care that they don't match. So, um, uh, oh yes, this is the very first 660 AV I've ever recapped. So I've never done one of these ones before. So this is a voyage of discovery for us all. Oh my, I nearly dropped my container with all the capacitors with the lid open, which would have just put capacitors everywhere all over the floor. That would have made me a very unhappy person. Right, solder. Now we have the good quality solder. This is the, uh, it's very thin stuff. I can't remember what the, it's 0.36 is the thickness, I think, 0.35. Um, it is 63 tin, 37 lead. Um, and I basically start off with some flux. I then hold the capacitor still. And then I apply the solder. Now, this side here, I'm close to the plastic. I am concerned about melting that plastic. So I'm going to be very, very careful as I put this on. So... I really don't like holding it at this angle, but oh, well, I'm, I have to say that was a bit lucky, but that actually got on there. So, oh, and then I stuffed it. All right, that's enough. I'm spinning it around. I'm holding it this way because I've got UV light shining on my um, my uh, my cleaned pads there, and so I'm trying to keep it in the position where the UV light is still drying those uh, pads, but that flipping it over there was enough to tell me that I really should not be doing it like that. All right. Okay, so that's up a bit. I need to apply some heat here. I'm really struggling with this one. Uh, I'm going to have to do this and do this and do this. And then I am going to actually apply the solder straight down. That way I can do this without melting that uh, scully port. Right, let's just check that now. Jump over back here to that. And... It's still a bit wonky, but it's on. It's just a question of whether I can live with it. Hmm. You know what the answer to that is? No. I'm gonna do it again. Such a perfectionist. <laughs> I've gotta find that last little trace of uh, uh, wick that I had before. It's probably fallen on the floor somewhere. Oh no, it's on my lap. There we go. Okay, so we're going to do this one again. And what I'm actually going to do with this one, I'm not following my own uh, advice with this. And yes, the physical size is not important as long as it fits and it meets or exceeds the voltage rating as well as meeting the capacitance rating. Try to be different if you can. Uh, um, try to be different uh, if you can help it. Now, the. Um, uh, yes, those birds outside, the ones you're hearing there, Australian ravens, and that's the noise they make. They sort of make a ah, ah noise. Uh, I don't even notice them because they're always there. So um, I could have theoretically tried to get a smaller physical capacitor to go on here to make it a little bit easier. Uh, but I'll be honest, I just use, these are the size that I use. So I'm, I'm quite happy with them. So my advice when I have done this before, I have always said to people, do the easy side first and the difficult side second. Now, I didn't follow my advice then. I was there trying to solder it from the difficult side first. And you can see where it got me. It got me with this, this uh, capacitor flying all over the place, me unhappy with the way it was. Uh, and so I am now coming at it from this side and this side has far easier access. And then I'll do the other side once this side is locked in. Okay, let's get some solder on there, shall we? There we go. A little bit crooked. A little bit crooked. 
I don't like crooked. There we go. But that is now flush with the board. It is attached by there. You can see when I give it a bit of a wiggle, uh, then it's a lot easier now to do the other side because that capacitor is not going to move around because uh, it is locked in on the other side. So I can just go in and grab some solder on the end of my soldering iron. I might add a little bit more flux here because I did remove quite a lot of it during that process. And bloop. and then I should be able to just come in here and do a little bit of, a little bit of that. And sure enough, that is now locked in on both sides. So there we go, happy with that. So that is basically what happens when I don't follow my own advice. Uh, and I try and actually solder the difficult side first. And as I said, this had a lot to do with the fact that I am trying to dry a UV solder mask at the same time as putting these caps on, which is not really working out very well for me, I have to say. Um, the stuff doesn't, depending on how thick you have it, it doesn't usually take too long to dry. Uh, UV solder mask, usually only a few minutes. Uh, if I'm in a mad screaming rush and it is sunny outside, I go out there with a little magnifying glass and I just, uh, whoops, I shine the, uh, I use the magnifying glass to just magnify the sunlight to about a, about the size of a quarter, or in, if you're in Australia, a 20 cent piece, um, and uh, and then I just sort of, uh, um, and then I shine that on where the UV solder mask is, and that makes it just dry super fast. All right, so there's these two. So these are the two little ones. There's only two of them that size all the rest are 47 microfarad 16 volt and they are uh, a lot easier to go on so let's now see if i can continue doing some uh, recapping while trying to dry my uv solder mask because i can definitely tell from a, at a glance here that it's still not dry it's still shiny uh let's try these ones so we've got three in a row here so i can potentially do that all right how are you doing here? I've been uh, going now for a long time, uh, so I will try and uh, crank this up a little bit quicker because I'm sure everyone's getting, excuse me, a little bit sick of it. Um, yeah, it's coming up for two hours. Sorry, guys. Um, I'm going to really step it up now. We're going to see some speed recapping. So we get our flux. This is one, just in case anyone is curious, if I wasn't live streaming this, uh, this would probably take me about, about 20 minutes to recap, I would say. That's usually how long it takes. If I've got a really dirty one, it might take me a little bit longer. Uh, really grubby ones, there's a lot more cleaning that needs to be done. This one wasn't that dirty. This one was a pretty easy one. So this one is probably about a 20 minute recap, and then it's just the cleaning, and then... Uh, and then the drying, um, but uh, but obviously when you're live streaming, and in particular when I just go on these tangents all the time, start talking about uh, you know vintage computer industry and whatnot. Um, the next thing you know, two hours have gone by. Okay, so we've got our forty-seven microfarad sixteen volt capacitors. And I'm just sort of plonking those in place. All right. And um, yes, now obviously just sort of uh, following up on what uh, Nate said there before. Um, it is when you are replacing capacitors, there's really no issue with going up in voltage but you absolutely don't want to change the capacitance rating so for example if you are removing say a 16 volt capacitor and you decide to replace it say with a 25 volt capacitor instead uh, that's fine you can go up don't go down but you can go up but you don't want to change the capacitance you want to make sure that the replacement capacitor is the same capacitance the same microfarads or nanofarads, or picofarads, or, you know, farads, mind you. I don't think you'll find many computers with capacitors of that are measured in farads. Um, you, uh, you need to make sure that that rating is the same. 
Now, when you're looking at capacitors like this one here, whether you may or may not be able to see, on the case there, it says 476. And what that means is the number 47 followed by six zeros. And that then gives you your measurement in, I think it's picofarads, which you can then translate into microfarads, which will be 47. Um, all right, so there's one side of those three capacitors done, and then I'm going to flip him over and do the second side. While I'm doing that, I might be able to dry some more UV. Okay. Let's just uh, do the other side here. I'm just going to move that. I'm going to have to come in at this from the top angle because I don't want to burn. This is the... Uh, Ram sim there, ram slot there. I don't want to burn that. I don't want to melt it. So I'm going to come in at this top angle. I've got a little bit too much solder there, but that joins okay. That joins all right. It's no problem. My soldering iron just seemed to stop getting hot there for a second, but I think it's fine. I've got a um. I'm still working with a uh, a cheap knockoff uh, soldering iron tip on this one. I mentioned uh, in one of my streams recently, and people might have seen it, while I was wicking, uh, my soldering iron tips snapped. Snapped in off. Um, and uh, so I was then forced to go to my backup tip, and my backup tip, oh, jeez, is something's not right. My backup tip is uh, a cheap Chinese knockoff. So it doesn't... Uh, it doesn't perform quite as well as the original one. I will buy another one. Actually, I think I might order it today because this one is really starting to piss me off. I have lots and lots and lots of different types of tip, but I just like using this one the most. It's the one here with this beveled edge. I love having that flat surface to make sure that you can get heat where you want it. And then it also has quite a good tip at the end of that bevel, which is good for you, you know, getting into little fine places and everything like that. So it is my favourite soldering iron tip. I do need to get one. Bruce is a savage with his equipment. Um, <clears throat> would I be willing to do a voltage adjustment demonstration on an early compact Mac analog board? Yes, I would. Um, if there is time at the end, I can probably do it. I do have a Mac Plus upstairs I can do it with. Um, but we'll see how we go. Um, if people start dropping off and falling asleep while I'm doing this. Um, but yes, I would be very happy to do that demonstration. It is actually something I would like to have on my, um, uh, sort of on my channel. I'm, I'd like to have a specific video dedicated to that purpose because it is something that does need to be done. Um, particularly with that, you know, with them all getting old, just going to check on the status of my UV solder mask here. See how it looks. Uh, uh. Why can't I see it? Here it is. And it still looks wet. <clears throat> um, what about this one here? I've had UV shining on this one a bit. Wet. It's it's kind of getting there. Anyhow. So we'll uh, we'll keep going. We'll keep going. I suppose while it's dry, I'm drying the solder mask, I could be doing some voltage adjustments, couldn't I? Uh, right. So I need this to be that way. So, let's see. Yeah, I'll we'll put the UV there. Mm, there. There. Okay. Ah, uh, right. Let me just check and make sure I haven't missed anything. No, I haven't missed anything. I am having trouble getting my soldering on, though, underneath this UV lamp. Uh, I need some flux here. I don't need to check what one goes where, because as I said before, two of them were 10 microfarad 16, all the rest are 47 microfarad 16, so I know that I've already done the two 10s, so everywhere where I need to put a cap now is a 47. Um, interestingly enough, I did uh, have contact with someone recently who was recapping a board, and they weren't using a kind of a recapping guide. I mean, I think they'd probably taken some photos of the board beforehand, but they just got a little bit overzealous when they were putting new capacitors on, and they ended up putting uh, capacitors in a place where there shouldn't have been any capacitors. Um, a lot of these boards have pads where there's nothing on them. 
And, you know, sometimes you look at it and you think, oh, no, a component's fallen off or something like that. But there are instances, many instances, I'm sure I can point out some on this board here, where there are pads with nothing on them. And this is one of the reasons why it is important to have um, a guide. Here we go. I've found one here. Right there. You can see there's some pads with nothing on it. And I know that there was never a component there because it has a little mound of solder on it rather than it being flat or having like a little, you know, sort of cut in it where something might have been ripped off the board. So when they're all sort of round like that, you know that they never had a component on them in the first place. Um, and so this is why it is important to sort of use a guide or take a photo of the board before you start taking all the caps off so that you don't accidentally end up putting a component somewhere that was never meant to have a component there in the first place. Um, so there we go. And I've got another one here I can do here. Come at it from this angle. If I come at it from this angle, I can get my UV light here. Yeah. Dry. Dry. No. Oh, wrong one. Put it there. There. Right. Another one here. I've removed some of the uh, solder mask you can see here, but I'm not really concerned about that. I'm not going to end up with a, um, a short there because uh, the uh, uh, I don't think there's any danger of those pins accidentally being in the wrong place. You know, pin the pins of the component accidentally touching the wrong one. When I put this on, this pin is really only in danger of hitting that pad there, and this pin is only in danger of hitting that pad there, which, of course, is what they're meant to do. Right. Putting this on. So you see that when I put this on, as I mentioned before, with the temperature setting on my soldering iron, I just do this kind of swipe. As I as I put it on, I just do this sort of swipe there, and you can see that it, it, I just hit it with that high heat quite quickly. Um, and so um, it, that then sort of, for me, just ends up getting, getting quite a nice join. Um, what am I hitting? Oh, here's this bloody UV lamp. This is, again, one of the issues when you're doing a live stream. I and mean, when you're doing work... Uh, you know, in your own time, you can basically set things up and you go, oh, I'm going to paint this with UV solder mask, I'm going to dry it, and then I'm going to get up and leave and I'll come back in, um, you know, sort of an hour's time or I'll move on to another board while that's drying or whatever the case may be. And in this instance here, I'm trying to kind of dry the UV solder mask at the same time as doing a live stream. And it's not that easy. In fact, it might end up being impossible, but let's see. Right. Uh, anyone have any questions? I mean, you know, we're going through a fair bit of repetition here and I'm basically just answering questions that no one's asking as I go. But if anyone has any specific questions, I'm always happy to answer them. Um, okay, plonking this on here. And of course, if you have asked a question at any stage during the stream and I didn't answer it, uh, don't fret. I do sometimes miss comments. Uh, feel free, if I haven't answered it, to submit it again. Uh, just ask the question again. And uh, hopefully I'll see it a second time around. And of course, if you haven't liked the video, please do so. Um, Oh, look at these. Jay's always good with the questions. I say, hey, have you got any questions? And he asks one. There are probably ones he knows the answer to anyway, but he's asked, he asks anyway. When are you planning a microscope cleaning? Image is horrible. Yeah, I just cleaned it. Um, yeah, so what I the problem I think I have with the microscope at the moment, and this is one that, as I said, Jay and I discovered recently, is that if this camera is slightly out of alignment, the picture goes a little bit sludgy. Um, and I think the camera is a little bit out of alignment. But look, as long as everyone can see it, um, any lifted pad repair tutorials on your channel? There are. Well, there's torn pads. If you have a look at my channel, uh, if you jump onto my channel, you will sign, find a section at the top called Featured. And within that, I think it's the very first video there is 
how to repair damage or lifted pads. Um, and uh, and yes, so there is uh, there is that on my channel, and you can uh, jump on and have a look and see if that is um, helpful to you. Um, I have done it from the perspective of a vintage Mac. You know, if you're if you've torn a pad on a on a newer computer, it's probably not going to be very helpful because they're very small. Um, my suggestion would be if you have torn a pad on a on a um, new computer, a lot of the time those pads are tiny, 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 and that's when it starts to get very hard to do unless you have a microscope. Um, I would recommend if you are working on you know modern computers with those very fine components. A microscope does become an essential item. Um, what I'm doing here, you could quite happily do without a microscope. I do it with one for two reasons. Because first of all, I've got a camera attached to it, so I can show you what I'm doing. And second of all, my eyes are terrible. Um, I don't see too good no more. And I do like to be able to see. So I use the microscope. I've positioned this cap a little bit kind of that way, a little bit further this way, so that I've got a little bit more room on the other side because I'm right next to the battery holder. So when I spin this around, it'd be nice if the sun came out and then it would really help me get this UV solder mask done. Nope, that's not working. Come it from underneath, maybe. Um, I might have to come from the top like I did with one of the other ones. I don't want to melt anything. The solder there. Melty, melty. There we go. Nice join. No melty. Do you also see a fair amount of older new bus and old PCI Mac boards coming in for recap? I have several in my collection that probably need it. Uh, no, I, I haven't. Uh, no new bus cards at this stage. I have done uh, a Macintosh 2SI kind of um, PDS new bus riser card thing. So for those of you who um, may not know the way the 2SI works, the 2SI has a PDS slot. But uh, you can get a card that slots into that PDS slot that has uh, an FPU, a floating point unit. That's one plus because obviously the 2SI didn't have a floating point built in, you know, a math coprocessor. So you can put in this card, it has a math coprocessor, but what it also has, coming out the side, it has a new bus slot. So if you have a new bus card you want to connect to a 2SI, a video card or an Ethernet card or something like that, you can use this riser card and then you slot the, um, the new bus card horizontally. So new bus card runs horizontally parallel to the board. And you can, you can do it that way. Um, and that one has some surface mount electrolytic capacitors on it. And I have recapped that. I have recapped one of my own uh, CPU daughter cards for the like 604 PowerPC computers. Are they PowerPC? Yeah. No. Yeah. I just I get confused by these CPUs all the time. Um, yes. 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 Um, and so I have uh, I have done some of those, but I've never done like a, a video card or an Ethernet card or anything like that. I haven't done any recapping on any of those. So uh, um, tried drying solar mask in the sun Wednesday. Thirty minutes stuff was still liquid. Okay, no worries. Yeah, we've got some pretty harsh sun here in Australia. Um, it is obviously now um, autumn, um, and so it's a little bit better, a little bit to more tolerable. But yeah, we've had some pretty warm summer days. And uh, and yeah, solar mask dries really quickly on those days. Uh, okay. Yep, this one is so clean. How do I get this one so clean? Here's my... Uh... Oh, incidentally, in one of my streams the other day, I was talking about the fact that this, um, um, uh, this flux... Uh, is it glows with UV light, which it does. Um, that's not accidental, and I didn't think it was. But I had a look at the Amtec website, and they do actually say, call it UV traceable, I think they use the word. Um, and so it is designed so that you can use UV light to spot whether you've still got flux on the board, uh, which is kind of nifty. Right. Righty, 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 righty. 
we're really we are getting close, guys. So um, you know, uh, anyone who's getting bored out of their skull, I apologise. Uh, it is just the way these things go. Uh, in particular, when I start chatting away, they do get slowed down. Um, I am always. Um, I always like to kind of share knowledge as much as possible, um, even if it's stuff you didn't want to know. Uh, and so for that reason, you know, I do often get sidetracked as I, you know, go on tangents and talk about um, some of the different things with these computers, some of the good things with these computers and some of the bad things with them. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, and of course, just jumping back to that comment about uh, soldering, uh, sorry, recapping new bus cards. One of the things I am going to be doing a video very soon on recapping a caddy loading CD-ROM drive and a floppy drive. I've already done in one of my live streams recapping a floppy drive, but I'm going to do it in a pre-recorded video as well. Um, because, yeah, uh, everything just needs recapping. That's the problem. Right, so I think I've done all of the caps that, uh, that you know, apart from the ones with the UV solder mask. Um so I have a couple of ways I can move forward. I can just say, dang it, and just stick them on. But if I grab some tweezers here, you'll see that this stuff is still, well, it's nearly dry, but it's still a little bit wet. Um, so, should I, should I, to my 12 viewers left, while I'm waiting for this to dry, should I show how to adjust the voltage on a compact Mac? I ask, I ask the uh, the Vox Pop um, whether I do that while I'm waiting for this to dry, and then I can put the last couple of caps on. I've got one, two, three caps that I need to put on. Uh, I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Let me try that again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So there were 13 in total, so I've got one, two, th 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 one, two, three with UV solder mask on it. So, um, right, so what have I got here? I'm down to watch the, uh, that thing I know nothing about. <laughs> yeah, all right, well, that's good enough for me. So um, let me just move this board while I get it dry. I'm just going to spin it around here. Back in a second, you can have a look at my empty chair. Um, if it was a little bit more sunny, I reckon I'd be able to do it out there, but it's not. So I'm just going to spin this around, get a little bit of UV light on these things. I hope you can still hear me over there. Right. So I just need to pop up to the house very quickly and grab a, um, uh, a compact Mac so that I can demonstrate adjusting the voltage. So give me two seconds, I'll be right back. Hello. Right. So, let's just go here to Big View. I'll just get this uh, out of the way. Here is a Macintosh Plus. This is my Macintosh Plus. Um, I have had this now for quite some time. 
I did a video of this. Sorry, I'm hitting the microphone. Sorry about that. I did a video about this uh, a long time ago uh, where I pulled it apart. Uh, I did it 2007, possibly even earlier. Uh, it's been a video on my channel. It's probably my first computer uh, video I put on. It's all pretty silly, but yeah, it's all a bit of fun. Um, now, I'm just gonna put it on a little bit here. Right, so there's my Macintosh Plus. Now this is one that I bought as uh, untested or not working or something like that, but it turned out to be working perfectly. So there's really pretty much nothing wrong with it. Now we're going to adjust the voltage of this compact pack here. Um, what I use, um, you obviously need a multimeter, excuse me, that's a very important thing you need. Um, I use paper clips, paper clip because we're actually gonna measure the voltage from inside this port here. That's the floppy drive port, it's the narrower of the two. That there is the uh, uh, SCSI port, that one there is the, the floppy port. So it's in that port that we're going to use to measure it. Um, and I'm gonna have to pull this apart, of course. And this one has T15 screws and it has three of them. It has one in the battery compartment. This is my super duper Bruce Rain made um, Brankus Creations whiz bang battery um, the macintosh plus uses a particular type of battery which are not readily available anymore there are i think uh, three point five volts 3.5 volts uh, i can't remember the code for them i do have them in some of my other videos but uh, they're quite expensive particularly out here to buy uh, one of those batteries it costs a lot of money so I devised this little invention here, and what this is, uh, is a little plastic holder which is specifically designed to turn a AAA battery into the same size as a AA battery. So if you have a AAA battery, you can fit it inside this to make the AAA battery work in a device that's meant to have a AA battery, because obviously AAA batteries are quite um, high power these days, particularly rechargeable ones, and you might have an old device that you know originally wanted um, AA batteries and you can just use this to make it a AAA battery and that just comes apart like that and then you can just put it, put that battery inside. Now what I have done with this is I have got inside here three LR44 1.5 volt batteries. Three times 1.5 volts equals three and a half volts so you end up getting three and a half volts by having those three there and then I put a little spring and that then means that that there is the, that's the negative under there, that's the positive there, and that gives you a three and a half volt battery. So that's what I have made for these. I, you know, I've punched quite a few of these out. I do actually intend to do a video to show how I made this step by step. It's not that difficult, but there are a few little tricky things. The main being that the LR44s um, don't fit in here terribly well. Uh, they're, they're super tight. I mean, to the point that you'd probably have to throw this away when the battery runs out because I don't think you'll ever get those out again. Um, so anyhow, that's what I use instead of the original battery. Works quite well as a clock battery. No real problem there at all. Put that to one side. Um, let's get this undone. Uh, where did I put my thing? Here's my thing. This is my T15. It's 10 inches long or whatever that is. 250 millimeters, 260 millimeters, something like that. If you're opening up Classic Max, buy one of these. For goodness sake, it makes life so much easier. I only bought one of these quite recently, and oh my goodness, it just makes life so much easier when you're opening these up. You end up just getting so much extra kind of torque behind it when you're undoing these screws. It's just so easy, I love it. So these two bottom screws on here, these are the ones with the very fine thread on them, the black ones, put them to one side. It's because they're screwing into metal. Uh, then the other ones here, there's one here in the battery compartment, that one is the wider thread, and it's a light colour, and that's the ones that screw into plastic. So, that, 1.3, 5 times 3, because 4.5, you see, mass was never my strong point. Yes, so the batteries that I'm referring to are actually 4.5 volts, not 3.5 volts, so, um, and as I said, I can't remember the code for it. It's A123, A32132, I can't remember. Um, you will find them. Uh, but as I say, to, to buy out here, I have to buy them from overseas, and they're very expensive to get brought out. So 
Um, yeah, so that's 4.5 volt, not 3.5 volt. I'm getting them mixed up with the 3.6 volt lithium batteries that you have in the uh, more modern computers. So yeah, 4.5 volt. Thank you for correcting my mathematics. I say mathematics was never my strong point, but in actual fact it was, but not sort of simple stuff. I just don't really, uh, I don't really pay attention too much to those sorts of numbers. Isn't that terrible? I use a calculator for that sort of stuff. <laughs> All right, so I've got to pull this apart. Um, and obviously the really important thing is to never use a screwdriver in the edge here, because then you end up with little dings in it like this one has, not caused by me. I, I got it like that. Um, I generally just get these open with my big buffy hands, my big puffy, fat, chunky fingers. Um, but you can sort of use things like, eh, eh, just it. You can use things like this, where you can sort of feed them in the side there and squeeze them to sort of open them up. So they do work quite well. If you have an original apple case cracker, that's great, but uh, not many people have those. So off comes the back. As I said, this is my computer, so I can treat it terribly, but I won't. Um, there's the shield coming off. Uh, now, of course, uh, this hasn't been switched on for a while, so there's really no danger uh, inside this voltage-wise. There are dangers with this, like, you know, you can damage things, but I'm not in any danger of getting a, a you know electric shock or anything like that, because it just hasn't been switched on. This hasn't been switched on in, you know, months. So there's real no, no problem there. There'll be no built up charge. But of course, if you have one that has been turned on recently, uh, I recommend you check out my video on discharging a CRT. It could save your life. Um, it just basically goes through all of the precautions that, you know, in actual fact, it's, it's the ones that Apple recommend for discharging the CRTs on these. Um, and it just makes it a little bit safer for, you know, fiddling around inside them. Now, what I'm actually doing here, I am not really going to be going anywhere near anything particularly dangerous because what I have to do with this is I do have to switch it on with the case off and that is dangerous because you're exposing yourself to you know live sort of voltage here in Australia we're talking about 240 volts AC which is enough to leave you in a very not alive state um, so very very careful I don't accept any responsibility you know you do this at your own risk it can be extremely dangerous. Uh, you'll see here that says international. That's because this is the 240 volt board, not the 110 volt board. So, um, <clears throat> flyback transformer. Um, so anyhow, this is um, this is how we go in and adjust the voltage. So, on the other side of the board, I'm going to show you this now. I'm going to, of course, when I do this, I'm not going to be able to show you this because. I'm going to be needing it to be facing to me. We've got some adjustments here. You've got, uh, what is that? That's brightness, focus, I think. I can't see them very well. I'll stand up. I'll stand up. Um, yeah, brightness, focus, uh, uh, vertical height, you know, adjusting the height, voltage, and then that is the width there. Now, most of these can be adjusted just with a little screwdriver, with the one exception being this one here. Uh, this one's got like a little ferrite core, and for adjusting that, I recommend using these TV adjustment tools. You can buy the, these uh, on eBay and Amazon and stuff like that. They're just TV, I think they just call them television adjustment tools or something like that. They're made out of plastic. And because they're made out of plastic, they... Uh, uh, you know, sort of, they're not going to get into the middle of that ferrite and get hot and, and you know, do all sorts of weird stuff. So anyhow, uh, they, uh, they distort the screen as well. As soon as you put a screwdriver around in the middle of this, you will distort the screen. And so then you're not getting an accurate adjustment. So you use these tools here to get in there and twist that around. But we won't need to adjust that because that's fine. Uh, I am going to do a video on adjusting the uh, dimensions at some stage. That, that is a video that will be coming. But for the ooh, for the moment, we're just going to be adjusting the voltage. So the only one we're going to be interested in is this one here, voltage. And that one there is just a little trim pot that you can adjust with a small flat-headed screwdriver, which I have here somewhere. Is that one? That looks like one. It's not one of my cheap ones, but it still works. So there's a little flathead screwdriver I'm going to poke into there and make the adjustment. But I, as I say, I'm going to need it facing me 
because I, I can't leave it facing you. But anyhow, I'm basically going into that little trim pot in there and just twiddling it to make an adjustment. So I'm gonna spin this around so that it's facing me and I can see it. Now, actually, what I should also then do is show you the plugs here. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna stick a uh, paper clip, which I did grab here. Oh, I grabbed one of the thick ones. I don't even know if it's gonna fit in. It does, it fits beautifully. Okay, so along here we've got pin numbers and I think it's either pin five or pin six. I'll try it out and I'll see which one it is. But you're starting from the left and counting across to the right. You've got pin one, two, three, four, five, six. And I think it's pin six. And pin six shows you what the five volt rail is doing. So we're gonna be adjusting with the five volt. So you have five volt, uh, got the head uh, for bed, getting up at 6 a.m. tomorrow. Good night, Dana, thank you for joining me. Um, okay, so that's the uh, so that's the five volt rail, and you should adjust with the five volt, not the twelve volt. That's what I've been told. So uh, there is twelve volt on here as well, but you are meant to adjust based on the five volt. So that's in that paper clip is stuck into pin. As I say, I'm pretty sure it's pin six. It's either six or five. We'll find out later. So that's stuck in there. So we need to get a multimeter, and we attach it to this, and the, that's the positive. We attach to that. The negative we can attach to. Anywhere, it's a chassis, you can attach it to the ends of these, you know, uh, you can attach it to this guy, I mean, wherever you can attach it to, you can just sort of stick it there. So, let's just spin this around. I will get my trusty multimeter. I am using a super fancy one. Now, you don't need a super fancy multimeter. Any digital multimeter that measures DC voltage will do. Um, so... I'll get that and I've got here, I'm going to use these just to make my life a little bit easier, but somewhere over the rainbow, I have little adaptery things that I can fit onto this that give me alligator clips or crop clips um, that will enable me to attach these to, uh, to these things and stay there rather than moving. So... Excuse me while I find these. They're, they're, they're here. I know they're here. Uh, they're just under stuff. If I can't find them, I do have alternatives. But I would really like to have the crop clip ones. They are um, uh, they just make life a lot easier. And I, they, I, This is the spot they're normally kept. There's a little container there. And they're not in it. Which means they're out here somewhere. Um, and I can't find them. So we'll have to just do without them. Um... What I might do is I might be able to use these. Just see if these fit into this uh, multimeter. <clears throat> Not all these do. So, sorry, this is taking a long time. <laughs> okay, there's that, and there's that. So what I've got, I've just taken my normal leads off, and I've got these leads here, which have little um, kind of clippy things on them that allow them to lock onto something and stay there. So I'm going to put this onto DC voltage. This is an auto ranging multi, uh, multimeter, which means that it just automatically adjusts to whatever the voltage is. But some older multimeters, you meet, multimeters, you do need to set them at a specific um, voltage range. And obviously, with this one being five volts, you want to make sure it's one that gives you uh, a sort of a five volt reading. Okay, so now I'm going to connect the positive one to the little paper clip hanging out the back. So he's hanging off. And then the negative one, as I said, I can connect that to anything negative on this thing here. And I'm going to, for me, it's just basically going to be whatever I can get it to stay on and not fall off. So there we go. I've got that hooked on to a little metal part of the board. All right, so now what I've got here is I've got my multimeter connected up to the uh, uh, pin six of the floppy drive port and to the negative uh, you know, of the board here. Now we need to connect power, and this is where it all gets dangerous. So I'm connecting up live power to this, so super precautions, gotta be careful. You know, hands away from all the high voltage, all that sort of stuff, and now we're gonna switch it on. And on she goes. Now, <clears throat> I have connected it to the wrong pin. The, I've connected it to pin six, and that is the minus 12 volt rail. So I'm gonna take this out, and I'm gonna try it in pin five. One, two, three. And that's more like it. That is now connected to the 5 volt rail. So all the stuff I was saying before about pin 6, wrong. It's pin 5. Now, 
this is on, it's switched on, nothing's going to happen. This is a Mac, it's, the, the screen is on, it's all displaying, that's all nice. I've got a question mark, you can't see it, but you just have to take my word for it. There's a question mark there. Actually, I can do a little side camera here, can't I? And we might be able to just see it. There we go, you can see the screen on. Let me just twist that up a little bit. There we go. Noise. Okay, so there's a flashing question mark. So that's just showing you that this Mac Plus does actually work. And then let's go back to here and let's have a look at the multimeter and see what it's saying. It is currently saying 4.887 volts. That's a little on the low side. We want that to be as close to five as possible. It doesn't have to be exactly 5.0, but we want it to be as close to five as possible. So now I'm gonna get my little flathead screwdriver here, like that. And I'm gonna place this into the little trim pot for voltage. And then I can twist this around one way or the other. When I turn it clockwise, it goes down. When I tur turn it counterclockwise, it goes up. I'm turning it counterclockwise now. We can see it just climbing up there. 4.93456678. Bang! Five, five, oh one, oh, oh, one, oh, oh, there. It's close enough for me. So there's five volts. We've now got five volts on that, and that is adjusted. So that's pretty much it. That's the adjustment. So once again, you have your multimeter connected to negative, which is any part of the chassis, and you have it connected to pin five on the, you know, on the top row, counting left to right, pin five of the floppy connector. And then that, then when you switch it on, this will show you the uh, five volt rail voltage. And then you make an adjustment with that little voltage um, trim pot on the uh, on the the uh, analog board, and that gives you your five volts. Okay, so that is basically the process. That is how you adjust the uh, um, the power on a compact Mac like the old 128K, 512K, or Mac Plus. I think it even works on um, SE and SE30 as well. There is a, uh, a little trim pot for adjusting the voltage, but if I remember rightly, it's really hard to access uh, and kind of dangerous to access. I think, oh, is it? Might be something else. Anyhow. Um, yeah, probably not on the SE, but anyhow. Oh, it's the Classic I'm thinking of. So the Classic... The Classic also has a voltage adjuster, I'm pretty sure, but it's really hard to find. So um, so this is really only for the 128K, 512K. So there we go. Um, I am just going to do this, and then I'm going to do this. Take that out. Take that off. And then I shall go like this. And... Maybe. No SD card. Okay, let's try that again. Uh, 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 uh. Try that again. <sighs> and hard disk emulation, Mac Plus, 96 megabyte. And then if I were to restart this with, with that's over here. Oh, wrong button. Come on, restart. There we go. So I've just restarted this. I've got this now connected up to my little floppy emu, emu, emulator, floppy emulator. And I have got a uh, little sort of uh, 100 megabyte uh, disk image on this uh, for the Mac Plus. You can see it's starting up there. Uh, and so, yeah, we get to see the Mac Plus being a Mac Plus. I'll just turn the brightness down a little bit there so you can see it. Um, and the flickering, is, of course, is uh, because of uh, synchronization issues with the camera. Um, and there we have the old Mac Plus. So let me just uh, connect up a mouse and shut him down. Okay. Because if you actually just switch these off when you're using a floppy emulator a lot of the time it stuffs up the disk image and it won't boot up again next time so let's shut that down and switch him off and there we go and let's unplug that and remove the uh, voltage danger from us of course that crt will still be charged up so i still need to exercise a lot of caution while working with it but uh, at least i have the mains voltage risk 
removed now. Okay, so that goes away. This, excuse me, I'll just, I'm just going to do a, uh, a quick put together. I'm not going to screw it all up. I'll do that later on. And there we go. So I just got a SCSI 2SD 5.0 that I'm trying to install on my LC3. Yeah, I tell you what, SCSI 2SD, what a great thing they are. I know they're a pain to set up, but what a fantastic thing they are for uh, for those uh, for those old Macs. Um, I have got so many SCSI 2SDs. I've got, I don't know, I've probably got, and I've got a few here that I'm planning to sell because I bought a whole bunch. But I've got um, in my just my my own computers. I've got at least half a dozen, I would say. Um, so let's do this back up there, back up to seeing my pretty face, and let's see if this is dried yet. I'm just going to grab. It's been sitting under the UV light. Even if it hasn't, I'm going to stick the caps on it because you guys have been patient enough. Okay, let's have a look. See. Incidentally, Nate, if you do have any issues with the SCSI to SD, um, feel free to uh, to ask any questions. I will help if I can. Um, I have installed lots of them. Right, so let's start over here. This is my UV solder mask, which still looks a little on the uh, wet side, but I'm just going to touch it with a... Yeah, it's still a little bit on the wet side, but it'll be all right. It'll be okay. As I say, you guys have been patient enough. So, I'm going to put some flux on there. Still a bit more table grip. We're going to get, uh, as I say, we've only got three more to go, so this is very nearly done. Um, do, do. I'll just check and see how many viewers we've got, because I could well have lost a lot then. We're down to 11 viewers, and I thank those 11 people for hanging on this long. Uh, I commend you. <laughs> um, I do not blame anyone who might have left at this stage because I do appreciate that this is uh, perhaps getting a little bit on the tedious side. Um, I mean, from my perspective, what ends up happening with this stuff is I'm going to be out here recapping this no matter what. You know, this is this is what I'm going to be doing on a day like today. I'll be sitting out here recapping because I've got so many to do. Um, but, uh, you know, I... Um, Yes, yeah, so as, as Jay said, we're the 11 that matter. This is very true. The ones that stay this long, you guys are the important ones. <laughs> um, so, um, uh, yes, I mean, I would be out, out here recapping anyway. So, I mean, from my perspective to then say, hey, you know what? I'm going to switch the camera on. It's Saturday afternoon. No big deal. Um, I'm, always, uh, I'm always happy to do that. And that just gives me an opportunity to sort of talk over as I'm doing this stuff. If anyone has any questions, I can answer them. Uh, if anyone's thinking about having a crack at recapping for the first time, they can sort of ask me any questions that they might want to ask that might potentially make that job a little bit easier for them. Uh, okay, I got as far as trying to initialize the partition, but it failed. So I'm trying again with the patched version of HDSC setup. What were you using before that, Nate? Can you tell me that? Um, were you using the original version of uh, Apple HDSC? For the original one, which of course is was would not work. Um, so, so one of the questions I would need to ask with that is first of all, when you uh, well, first of all, have you updated to the latest firmware because there are regular firmware updates to the uh, SCSI to SD and they can be downloaded from uh, SCSI to SD website. Um, that would be number one. The other would be when you set it up. Um, what size drive did you set it up as? Um, and then, uh, yes, and then, of course, the next thing is what did you format it with? And my recommendation to anyone who is using a SCSI to SD, I would format it with Hard Disk Toolkit, the FWB Hard Disk Toolkit, which you will find on Macintosh Garden. I can't remember which version it is, but it's one of the earlier ones. And it will allow you to quite happily format a SCSI to SD drive without any errors. So that would be my re my recommendation number one 
would be um, Hardest Toolkit. Recommendation number two would be Silver Lining. Recommendation number three would be Lido, L-I-D-O. Uh, the original found on the LC Disc Tools disc. Yes, unfortunately, they, they are they're designed to only work with a very, very small range of drives. So unless you actually go in with the SCSI to SD and set it up to trick the computer into thinking it really is like a quantum drive or it really is, you know, sort of like a Mac store or something like that, um, then it won't work. But to be honest, that to me is just a, a step, a, a totally unnecessary step. If you, you don't need to worry about you know, trying to change the the um, you know the codes or the serial number or anything like that. Just leave it as it is. Leave it all with the default settings, but then just set it up with um, format it with Hardest Toolkit. So, um, uh, hello, Zombie Geek. Thank you for joining. Um, and if uh, it ran SCSI to SD this year, set up as a two gigabyte Seagate according to instructions found on sixty eight KMLA. So. The instructions on 68K MLA are the ones that sort of everyone uh, refers to, everyone goes to, and that's fine. There's really nothing wrong with them, but those settings, are they're trying to make it that so that you don't, you can format it with the normal utility. But as you've just discovered, even, even after following those settings, it won't let you. And that's because, uh, probably because you've set it up as a 2G partition, I think the old uh, formatting software wouldn't know what to do with a 2 gig partition. Now, Hard Disk Toolkit is fine with a 2 gig partition. It will have no problem with it at all. It'll format it quite happily. Um, but that whole thing of um, setting it up as a 2 gigabyte Seagate, so where you go in and you set the settings where you tell it it's a Seagate drive, you don't need to do any of that if you're using Hard Disk Toolkit. You quite literally go in there, you set what SCSI ID you want, you set... Um, which should be zero if it's going to be in the internal drive. So you set your SCSI ID, you set the, drive, the size of the drive, you save it, that's it. You don't need to worry about changing it to Seagate or anything like that. It can just stay as SCSI to SD. You don't need to change the numbers or anything like that. They can all stay the same because Hard Disk Toolkit doesn't care what those things are set to. So anyhow, that's my recommendation. It just makes the job so much quicker and easier. I do plan doing a video on this at some stage. Um, but as you will have heard me say probably a few times during the stream, I have a lot of videos planned. Um, and it's just a matter of getting to them when I can. My next video is going to be Macintosh Portable, Tear Down and Recap. Uh, that's not going to be a live stream. That's going to be a pre-recorded one. And that I am hoping to start recording tomorrow if I have time. Uh, I have lost my last cap. Where is it going? Where is it going? Ah, here, just there. There it is. Oh, that one actually looks dry. Look at that. So at least one of them got dry. Um, that's my UV solder mask. Okay. Right. Last cap on the board. Yeah, uh, the sort of the hard disk toolkit is, is um, something that I used back in the day um, when I used to use Mac computers at the time. I, I actually worked as a um, Macintosh Tech in about 1993, I think, something like that. Um, I used to go out, you know, visit businesses and repair their computers. I did it for someone else. I was just an employee of a larger company. And uh, Hard Disk Toolkit was one of the things we used back then um, because it was such a versatile formatting utility. It was just, it was really, really good. Um, and then, of course, when I you know, kept working with Max after that. I kept using it. So, very good utility to uh, know about. I've actually got a uh, drive, uh, like a SCSI to SD, what would I call it, kind of like a universal boot drive that I set up a long time ago. And it's got a system folder and utilities and a whole bunch of apps and stuff. And when I, because one of the things that I do is I sell pre-configured SCSI to SD drives. So if someone says to me, hey, I've got a, Mac LC3, whatever the case may be, and I want to put a SCSI to SD in it, what I do is I uh, get uh, an SD card, you know, good quality one, you know, like a SanDisk or something like that, and I put that in, I format it for use on the LC3, I install an operating system on it, I install all the utilities and all that sort of stuff, and then I sell that to someone, I sell it for more, it costs more obviously because there's the extra work involved, but I then sell it to someone ready to just drop straight into that LC, LC3, ready to go. 
So you get the SCSI 2 SD, you put it in, you switch it on, and you're away. It boots straight away because I've put all the system on there. Now, of course, for a lot of people, and a lot of people that I associate with who like to tinker with these things, that just takes all the fun out of it. It takes all the joy out, and they don't want that at all. They want to just get the bare SCSI 2 SD and do all the work themselves, which I totally understand that's how I am. But for you know, for some people that might be you know it might be having trouble with the setting it up, or they might you know might be wrestling with it, or they just don't want to have to bother. They just want the computer to work. Uh, they buy a SCSI to SD from me with everything all pre-configured. So that's one of the things that I do, and and so that's one of the reasons why I research all of these utilities to find out which ones work best. So, all right. Well, I think that's it for all the caps. I'm just going to go in and do my normal checks. So the checks that I normally do are. First of all, check to make sure all the caps are in the right place. Second of all, make sure they're all the right polarity. And third of all, make sure they're all stuck on properly. So let's start. We've got, we know that they're all 47 except for these two here, which are 10 microfarads. So they're all fine. By the way, if anyone's wondering what this thing is here, that thing there, that flat bit of metal, that's a fuse. Um, okay, so there's these two here. I've got the polarity there. I've got plus and I've got plus, and I've got the line on the same side as the plus. So that's correct. Give these a nudge, 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 wink, wink. There we go. They're all they're all uh, nice and solid. So all the rest are 47. So I can just do a quick scan of the board here. 47, 47, 47, 47, 47, 47, 47, 47, 47, 47. So they're all good. Um, and then give that a nudge. Give that a nudge, positive to positive, and nudge, nudge, wink, wink, positive to positive. I've done those. Can I do that one? Yes, I did. That one there, positive to positive, nudge, nudge. That one there, positive to positive, nudge, 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 nudge. They're all good. This one here, good. This one here, good. And this one down here, good. Okay, so that's it. Did you ever have to do these kinds of repairs back then? Absolutely not. Nor would I have even attempted to do that. I, this is a skill that I've picked up much more recently. I've been using, I've been doing soldering and using a soldering iron for years, but doing wire repairs and that sort of stuff. It wasn't until around about 2013, I want to say, somewhere around then. 13 or there soon after something like that that was around about when i started uh doing more component level type repairs and so yes no never did this sort of repair all the sorts of repairs i would do back then would be uh system based they would just be um you know sort of and sometimes you know maybe having to replace a computer or replace a big part of a computer but never ever any component level repairs back then and so just wouldn't have even wouldn't have even dared attempt them back then back in those days when i was a little young fella well certainly younger than i am today um right uh, i enjoyed your video reviewing the different types i went with the five based on the form factor and the built-in molex yep they're the two things i like about it the most um a lot of the time the scuzzy 2 sd can get all the power it wants from the scuzzy bus but if it can't it's just so much easier to just be able to plug in the normal molex connector than having to find an adapter uh, and thank you very much for watching, and I'm glad you enjoyed it. I'm glad it was of value. I, I do I do appreciate that. I mean, that was the, the purpose of doing it. So, uh, um, And they did end up watching it as well, because um, I did end up getting some uh, contact from Inertial Computing in America who sell that particular product, because they obviously saw the video and saw that other people were watching it. And so they then uh, sent me some of their um, uh, mounting brackets, so that I could try them out. And then obviously they are hoping I would then jump on and talk about how good they are. And to be honest, they are. The mounting brackets are great. Uh, if you're going to be buying a 5.1, you want to get one of those mounting brackets for sure. Um, you know, my argument was that if you buy a 5.0, you don't need a mounting bracket. But um, their argument is if you've got a 5.1, you buy this mounting bracket and it works really well. And I agree with that. But of course, then the mounting bracket is an additional cost. Um, all right, so uh, reached my limit of being awake and I must go to bed. Keep up the fun stream, Bruce, and I'll catch the rest later. Thank you, Steve. I do appreciate you hanging on for such a long time. I know this is we're hitting it for three hours now, so I will be wrapping this up very, very soon. 
Um, I am going to jump across to here. Now, uh, I think I will probably have to test it because I think people will probably get a little bit annoyed if I go through all the recapping and don't fire it up. So uh, please just hang on for a couple of minutes longer. I do apologize, but the case is upstairs. So um, I am going to uh, I'm going to have to uh, grab the case in order to test it with the power supply and everything. So I will be back in a couple of minutes and I will uh, fire it up and we can just check and see that it works. So just give me two minutes. <clears throat> I'm back. Honey, I'm home. Okay. So, testing time. This is the uh, pizza box case. Pizza box case we have here. <coughs> uh, that I'm going to have to put this back into. And all these like RF shields, which I hate. I just hate these things. Um... Part of me wants to keep them to make that the computer is complete. Then part of me just wants to throw them away because I hate them. So I've got my little Ziploc bag here that I've put. Uh, well, I've got a couple of 16s here. It came with some 16s, but I'm pretty sure I have some 32 megabytes here. But will at least allow me to start it up with those. So the board basically lives here. In order to get it in there, I need these things out of the way. This is the CD-ROM drive and the hard drive here, they've got to be pushed forward and out of the way to get the drive, the uh, board in there. Um, you can see this is a caddy loading CD drive. So this is one of the ones I will be recapping later on, showing people how that how to recap them. Uh, I have I actually already have a recapping guide for this caddy loading CD ROM drive on my, uh, excuse me, recap Mac website, um, but I will be doing a video explaining how to recap it. They're a little bit on the fiddly side, but, uh, but you know, they're... Uh, uh, it doesn't need to be done, it just can't be helped. Surface mount electrolytic capacitors inside. And it is, um, I think it's a Sony mechanism from memory, and the board is rubbish. It's just a really poorly made board. Okay, so this has a little clippy thing here, and it's on a sled type thing, so that just slides out. It doesn't have to come all the way out, it just needs to come out enough for me to get the board in. Same with the hard drive. This has a little plastic thing here, we just... Um, you clip that down and then I can I can push this out like that, like that, coming out. Um, so all of the plastics on these things are ridiculously brittle. Uh, oh boy, that took a lot of effort that did. Alright, so get him here. So uh, actually quite similar to the LC form factor. It's bigger. It's obviously it's a pizza box, but where the, the LC is like your uh, your medium sized pizza, this is your family sized pizza. So this one's uh, got extra pepperoni on it, um, and uh, 
there is plastic lining this, you know, because obviously when you put this in, there's all this metal here. You wouldn't want it to touch this base, but there is a plastic lining there to stop that. Um, this basically is inside. You've got to make sure the ports point out the back, otherwise it'd be a bit silly, wouldn't it? Or as, uh, what's his name from Eve, EEV blog would say, you put it in upside down, all the electrons will fall out. Um, okay. Right. Here we go. Okay, so this has got a couple of little plastic groove type things. I'm not doing a very good job of demonstrating that, and I do apologise. I mean, if I was doing this as a pre-recorded video, I'd do a little bit of B-roll video work and do some close-ups of it, but I don't have that, so. Um, right, so that's, I'm just going to make sure that everything's sitting solidly. There we go. Are we in place? No, we're not quite in place yet. It's not quite into the little notches here. There are these little notches. Oh, I see. I've got my, my little. There's a little plug here for the. Uh, I think that's for the light. All right. So that's in there. Now it's held in with a couple of screws. I'm only going to do one of them. Uh, oh wow! Steve woke up again. <laughs> Welcome back to the stream, Steve. Um, we're at the testing phase. It's the very last minute here, so we really won't be too much longer. And then everyone who's in a part of the world where it's like nighttime now can get some sleep. And I can start drinking. Because it's that time here. Drinking time. Um, actually, I can't really because I'm, I'm heading out in the car later on and because I don't drink and drive. But... Yeah, so I've just got one screw holding it in. There are actually two screws in. There's meant to be one here with a little plastic sort of spacer thing, and then there's one here. But I'm just going to put one in just to hold the board in. That's all I care about for testing. Let's plug a few things in. I'm going to plug in the LED. Just here. Uh, and then three hours on Discord. Uh, you know, I could actually jump onto Discord today um, because I have... Um, I've got a lot of work to do on the computer, so I can Discord and computer work at the same time. Uh, adding more uh, uh, recapping guides to my website. I added uh, the 840AV today. There is obviously the 660AV, this one there is a recapping guide for that. But there is now an 840AV guide there as well. Um, so anyone who's wanting to recap an 840AV, you're safe for guides now. Uh, and I'm also going to be adding a 610, I'm going to be adding a 6100, 7300. Uh, I will do a guide for the floppy drive as well, but I've, got a, I've still got to take some photos of that. And what's the other one I got recently? Oh, a VX, I'm going to be adding that. There's already VI there, and they're virtually identical. So these plugs here are, are for the uh, audio, AV ports, so I'm just going to plug those in. It's, it's actually one of the really nice things, people may or may not know this, even working with some of the newer computers. Most of the time when you're working with Mac computers, um, all of the plugs are different, which just makes it really good when you're putting things together. You don't accidentally plug the wrong thing into the wrong thing. Um, all the plugs are a slightly different shape or size or, you know, whatever. Uh, so one might be three pins, one might be, might be two pins. So even something like this with the AV. They're both only two cables, a black and a red, but they did this one here with three pins, with one of them not being used, and they did this one here with two pins, so you can't get them mixed up. Just a nice little bit of design for anyone putting something like this together, um, that you know exactly where they go. I've worked on some other computers that may or may not be Amigas that aren't like that. They have plugs that you can really connect the wrong way if you are not paying, paying attention. Um, okay, so connecting up my audio for my CD-ROM drive so that I can use this thing as a fancy CD player. Uh, oh, I might get a bit of mist going on this, eh? CD-ROM drive, caddy CD-ROM drive, put the old mist in there. Get a load of mist. I love that game. Okay. Right. And I... Oh, yeah, here's the SCSI cable for the... This, I'm really connecting everything up here. I, I, this, in terms of testing, I mean, I, I'm really connecting everything up here. Um, there. And there. So this is pretty much everything all connected up. This is the uh, hard drive that came with it, which is a 500 megabyte 
came with this purchase. 500 megabyte Apple SCSI drive. Now, I don't know what these originally came with, but this really does look like the original drive. So I'm gonna go ahead and say that this is the original drive because, you know, I think it is. Uh, there we go, CD's in. The CD juts out a little bit further because uh, it uh, it's, sits flush up with the case. So that's everything. I believe everything connected up here. Uh, and I'll tell you what, if it doesn't start up, it's going to be it's embarrassing as hell. Um, let's do that. So that's my power cable facing that way. And then I need to connect up the screen to it. And I have a little portable screen here. Just a little tiny weeny one. This is a 1080p. And this one is special. It's different to other ones because this one has some pigeon poo on it. Which I'm going to have to clean right after I finish this stream because that's gross. Uh, and if you're wondering why it has pigeon poo on it, it's because this workshop is outdoors and uh, I left the door open the other day and and it was raining and some pigeons came in and uh, spent a little bit of quality time here getting out of the rain and uh, pooed on this. So isn't that nice? I love those pigeons. I keep chickens which means I have lots of pigeons hanging around trying to get their food. Okay, so I've got this, I've got one of these little adapters to VGA. I'm going to set this on just sort of an automatic one. Let me set this on, say, 13 to 19 inch, which is what it's already on. Uh, I'm going to connect this up to the screen. I'm going to connect this up to some power. Uh, this was computer was given to me by someone quite computer savvy, so I'm expecting that there won't be any personal information or anything like that on the uh, on the uh, the hard drive so okay um, any monitor recommendations for old Macs that display nice and crisply uh, no, I, I can't go I can't go as far as that I do actually have a monitor which does a beautiful crisp display and it, it does it because it's sort of uh, you know I mean most of them of course are in this 16 by 9 proportion. And these are all in outputting like more like a five by four, which means you're going to end up with black pillar boxes on either side or a stretched out image. Uh, I much prefer the black pillar boxes. I hate stretched images that just, they drive me bananas. Um, so, um, yeah, so for my recommendation would be, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, if you're getting a modern LCD display, one that you can set it so that it doesn't stretch the image out, which most of them will allow you to do. I mean, even this one does. And this is, I mean, this is a tiny bit of screen. Um, but yeah, most of them will provide you a pretty sharp image uh, these days, the modern LCDs. So, all right, I'm going to switch this on. This has a power switch at the button, uh, power switch, a power button at the front that enables me to turn it on. I'm going to press it now. I've got power connected to it. So in theory, it should just start. If it doesn't, I've done something wrong or it was broken, which I don't think it was. It did make a chime. It was a very quiet one. You probably wouldn't, wouldn't have heard it. Um, let's see if I can get this screen on. Oh, there's a screen and we're set on HDMI. Hang on. Source. AV1, AV2. Oh, VGA, I missed it. V oh, I missed it again. It'll come around again. Here we go. So I'm on VGA now. Oh, no signal. And it could be something to do with this adapter. Ugh. I don't think it's because of the pigeon poop. Uh, I'm going to change the settings on this adapter. Um, and of course, there is the other thing that it wasn't connected when I first switched it on. And sometimes these guys, if it's not connected when you switch it on, VGA, SVGA, let's just set this on. I tried this setting here. Do, 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 do. But it did chime, which is a good sign, albeit quietly. I am going to, do I have a keyboard out here or even a mouse? Oh, I'm just going to switch it off and on again. Off. And of course, the other thing is I haven't cleaned the board either, so. Just switched off again. It's just switched off again. VGA. Oh, look at that. Okay, you can't see it because it's all bright as old. Let me just go in here and adjust, make some settings adjustments. 
Uh, we'll go here to uh, show webcam settings. We'll go here to not that one, but this one. And then I will go here to, there we go. Oops, a bit far. A bit flickery, I do apologize. That's the light, the fluorescent light is flickering. But at least you can actually see it. Uh, let me see if I can unstretch it. Menu. And we'll go down here to display ratio. That's what we want. Display ratio. 4 by 3. There we go. There we go. So now I've got more of a... There we go. So, that was it saying that the clock's not set to the right time. And there we have booting into some form of System 7. I can't tell exactly which one, but it is working, it is booting, it has charmed, it's all happy. And so it has worked. So it is uh, a, a moment of great joy uh, and rejoicing and uh, there will be songs written after me and all that sort of stuff. So, um, let me just jump back to that. There we go. And let me switch this back up again. I can lean over this thing. Whew! Jeez. That took it out of me. Right. So, thank you everyone for watching. I do appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed it. I'm sorry it went for three hours. Um, and, um, and for those 11 people, those 11 lovely, important people that have hung on right to the end, I thank you very much. Um, please like and subscribe and all the normal stuff. And, uh, and I will uh, hopefully see some of you at the next stream. And uh, once again, thank you for watching. Have a good rest of um, night, day, whatever it is in your part of the world. So thanks again and goodbye. And I, uh, are you sure you want to end your stream? Yes, I am. Thank you. Goodbye.